Good evening. Seeing the time. Good evening. Seeing the time and seeing a quorum. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 7th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be, <clears throat> we will remain then, we will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. And we welcome our incoming student member of the board. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God and liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item for consideration is the agenda. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to there tonight's agenda? There are no additions or changes. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom, it over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session an informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. Our next item is selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who signed up will be permitted to speak. Our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Our second speaker is Ms. Deb Sullivan. Our third speaker is Ms. Sharon Saroff. Our fourth speaker is Tamia Moore. Our fifth speaker is Donna McDonough. Our sixth speaker is Troy Mitchell. Our seventh speaker is Brenda Pfeiffer. Our eighth speaker is Laura Showalter. Our ninth speaker is Anna Gaffold. And our final speaker is Jesse Layson. Thank you. Our next item is advisory and stakeholder groups. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the interim superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. 
The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. As a board practice, we do uh, welcome and acknowledge our elected officials here this evening and give them the opportunity to speak at the beginning. So with that, I would like to call forward Delegate Rick Metzger. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a joy to be here and I understand the three minute rule. I'm in health and government operations and sometimes we have over 175 people testify. So I understand that. I'm Delegate Rick Metzger and I represent Essex, Dundalk, Edgemere, and part of Rosedale and Middle River in Annapolis. My wife and I are both graduates of Baltimore County Public Schools. As a matter of fact, I met her in the 11th grade at Kenwood High School in Essex. After graduation from Kenwood, we married and have been happily married for 43 years. I'm telling you this for this reason. Having history and knowing history is important in life. Knowing what has worked and knowing what the challenges the students face are the first steps in educating our children. The job of a superintendent should not be given to someone out of state. The job of a superintendent should be given to someone who has attended Baltimore County and has a history in Baltimore County Schools. Someone who has attended in private and worked in public schools, who has been an administrator in Baltimore County Public Schools. I can honestly, ladies and gentlemen, cannot think of a more qualified person of superintendent in Baltimore County Schools who has all these qualifications than Verletta White. Ms. White is a homegrown candidate for this job. She attended Baltimore County Schools. She taught in Baltimore County Schools. She has been administrator in Baltimore County Schools. She has been the interim superintendent for the past two years in Baltimore County Schools and finishing her doctorate degree. Mrs. White has the background, has the knowledge and the experience to be the next superintendent to Baltimore County, take us to the next level. I have met and I've talked with her in Annapolis on several occasions. As a matter of fact, I've been so impressed with her that she and her staff have full use of my office when they come to Annapolis. She has been a leader. She's been a champion of Baltimore County Public Schools. I have spoken to many Baltimore County teachers and they have given her 100% job performance. She loves her, te she loves her teachers, teachers as families, her students as her own. A friend of mine in a local elementary school said that she has not seen anyone like her. Miss White gives of her efforts, her time, and her talents. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please give her serious consideration for the next superintendent of Baltimore County. Thank you tonight for your time. God bless you. Thank you, Delegate. Next, we would like to welcome and acknowledge Councilman David Marks, representing the 5th District. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before the Board of Education. Uh, thank you to all of you for your service uh, for the children of Baltimore County. Thank you to Ms. White for the um, leadership you have provided and the constant communication you provide in my office. Um, I'll be very brief. I'm here uh, to ask you to give full consideration uh, to the motion to look at a boundary adjustment for Perry Hall Middle School. Um, this is a very frustrating situation. Uh, I have been in office for nine years on the County Council. I've done my best as a councilman to uh, lower the zoning in the Northeast to reduce uh, school overcrowding by blocking what I thought were harmful developments. Um, and I have supported capital projects throughout the area, uh, including air conditioning, but also expansion projects. Uh, quite frankly, the State Senate's failure to pass the Build to Learn Act has had serious repercussions throughout Baltimore County, throughout my district from Towson to Kingsville, and this is one practical effect of it. Uh, I am concerned that if we don't take immediate action, um, our students are going to be condemned to being in conditions exceeding 120 percent overcrowding for the next foreseeable future. Uh, I know it's a controversial subject. I just ask you to give it your full consideration. I also think the school board really needs to look holistically at boundary adjustments. My understanding is that other jurisdictions routinely have boundary adjustments. 
Um, and quite frankly, it is a complaint I hear from the home builders whenever I talk to them about impact fees and school construction, that we just do not have a natural boundary adjustment process. Um, the county council, uh, I think I speak for all of my colleagues, we're here to support you with construction money. I'm looking at impact fees. I'm the sponsor of a bill to do that. Uh, but I think the Perryall Middle School situation is very urgent, and I simply ask you to give it your full consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Marks. We next want to acknowledge and welcome Delegate Ben Brooks. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Thank you. And I just want to say a great thanks to the board for allowing me to come before you this, this evening. Uh, I guess I could start off by saying I want to echo what my colleague from, uh, from the House said, you know, but uh, I too am here to offer my support for uh, uh, Valida White. You know, um, oftentimes we go out and we start looking in other areas for what uh, we have right here, you know, and uh, being a, a Baltimore resident for 40 years, being a business owner for 38 years, you know, and I, this is my fifth year in, in the General Assembly, you know, and I understand about negotiating and, you know, working across the aisle and, you know, and creating that positive relationship with individuals, you know. But I also understand that there are certain nuances that one has who grew up in the system, you know. She, uh, she attended Woodline Elementary. She went to Woodline Middle, Woodline High, you know, post-secondary education at, uh, at, at Towson University, you know, uh, Notre Dame for her, her, her master's and now working on a doctorate at Morgan. Morgan. Now, her kids uh, goes to Baltimore County Schools. So this individual is invested, invested in our community. And, and that's what we want. That's definitely want, what we want, you know. Uh, I, uh, I'm from a family of 13, you know. We, uh, uh, the, the year I started college, my parents had nine kids in school, three in college and six in high, high and elementary. So I understand the value of, of, of an education and I understand that investment that we make, we want it to get the best out of it, you know. You know. I, uh, here again, uh, my parents were trying to send the girls to school. Us guys, we had to make it on our own. So I'm, I'm, I had to go to Vietnam to go to, go to college. But th at the same time, that was an end, a means to an end, you know. But, uh, but I truly think we've got what we need right here in Baltimore County. And even under all of the trials and tribulations and things that she's gone through, that integrity, that honor, those values, that ethics still remains intact, you know, you know. Uh, we, we just gotta do this, you know. The, the audit report is done, you know, now, you know, and it came up with no major, major issues. So I'm here again to state my support for Valida White for Superintendent of Baltimore County Schools. Uh, my name is Ben Brooks, and I approve this message. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Delegate Brooks, sure. and we do want to thank you for your military service as well as your service uh, in the House. Thanks. So I thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I now call our advisory groups to speak. And leading off from Baltimore County Student Council and Superintendent Student Advisory Council is Mr. Ruben Amaya. Good evening and welcome. Um, so, uh, the Baltimore County Student Councils last week, we held our last event of the year, the BCSE Bull Roast, uh, where we sworn our new officers, and I do want to con congratulate our new president, Angela Chen, who will be taking my spot next year, and I know she'll do a great job, um, and I'm very excited for the future of our organization. Uh, and speaking of the future, I do also want to uh, echo from our delegates in the back about uh, the superintendent search and that process. Um, it's now May 7th. Um, um, and we still don't have candidates for superintendent, and the deadline is nearing. Um, I think it's important that we look that in past years, 
Usually candidates are picked way before May so that stakeholders have time to decide uh, on a superintendent. Um, and we need to look for a solution. Uh, and I have a great idea uh, for a solution. And she's sitting right here with all of you. And that's Mrs. Verlita White, who is our current superintendent. Um, and her record shows 20 years in public education right here in BCPS. As our delegate said, she's invested in our communities. Uh, and she is serving right now as our current superintendent for the past two years. And I don't know about you, but I think she's doing a bang up job as our superintendent. She truly cares about the students uh, and knows what's best for us. Um, and I also think it's important that we look that we don't have someone outside of state. I think it's important that we look at continuity of leadership. This shouldn't be like Game of Thrones where we have a different superintendent every other day. Um, and I say that because if I'm a sophomore right now in high school and we pick another superintendent, that would be their fourth superintendent. So we have to think about continuity of leadership as well when we look at who we want to pick as our superintendent. And when we say concerns of the audit, it's out and there's nothing. So there shouldn't be any reason why we should not pick someone who is more than qualified to serve as our superintendent. And I know that Mrs. Rolita White will do an amazing job because she already has. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, my microphone was not on. Miss Abby Baton from Tabco, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Han, Ms. White, and members of the board. This afternoon, I met with three first-year teachers from the same school. These are all effective teachers who would have remained in Baltimore County except they have chosen to leave because teaching in their school has been a detriment to their health. Those are their words. They report that students throughout their building are threatening and assaulting other students and staff members. Students are disrupting instruction and undermining the safety of the school environment. Administration said these ad incidents would be handled, but they have not been. Because faculty know their referrals are not responded to, they stop writing them. This makes it appear that referrals have gone down when what has really happened is teachers have given up. One of them reported that today there was a fight outside their, outside their classroom and the teacher was hit by a student. It was not the first time this teacher was assaulted at school. These teachers decided to come to me with their stories because they love teaching and want to make a difference. They felt so beaten down by the system, they chose to leave our system and apply for teaching jobs elsewhere. It was clear throughout our conversation that these teachers loved teaching and wanted someone to hear their grave concerns. I am compelled to share this story with you so everyone understands that until we consistently implement and critically that our faculty and administration follow our behavior plans, we will have these problems occurring over and over. Why is it that if we walk into one school, the halls are quiet and under control, and another school at the same level is totally out of control? Consistency, accountability, collaboration, and leadership, that's why. We need to not only work collaboratively together to address these issues, we need to make sure the consistency is evident throughout the system. We can't continue to lose teachers when we have the power and tools to get our schools under control. Consistency and teaching respect are at the heart of the problem. We must do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Our next speaker for this evening is PTA Council of Baltimore County, Jane Lee, President. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Superintendent White, board members. I am here tonight to express the support of PTA Council and its membership for the Hybrid Board of Education. We worked strongly for that to happen we worked before the bill was made with the makers of the bill to put our input in. We then went to Annapolis. We had a 68 to 1 vote, something that's never happened at a general council meeting to support it. And we are happy to see it working. I also want to thank the current chair of the board for allowing things to be mailed to my home and my email because a 
two years ago when I asked for that to happen, I was told that unless my address was placed on the council website, that couldn't be done, which is why my address is now out on the internet, not something I wanted. Part of my first communication with the new board chair was to let her know that unless I appointed someone or approved someone, I didn't want to see them listed as a representative of the PTA council because I'm the only one that can appoint them and she has lived by that and I appreciate it. Other parents are welcome to speak and be part of groups, but they don't represent council unless they were chosen by us. I also want to thank you for including us by holding a meeting between us and Ray and Associates where we were given the opportunity to offer thoughts on skill sets, traits, qualifications, and the direction we wanted the system to head. But we do know that now is the time for confidentiality on the part of the board in their decision making process and we fully support that. In the last week or so, I have been contacted from concerned members and including my board members who are afraid that they were going to be singled out for asking questions or accused of bullying by asking for clarification. I have reassured them that asking questions is advocating for children, but if they're concerned, come to me. I will ask their questions, speak for them, and keep their names confidential. Questioning by stakeholders is advocating, and questioning by board members is part of their duty of care and often their fiduciary responsibility. Be assured that I will continue to ask questions on behalf of our membership and speak out when I feel it's necessary, and I hope this board will as well. That is why we wanted a hybrid school board who answered to the community and the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Our next speaker this evening is uh, the Executive Director, Tom DeHart of CASE. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. So good evening, Board Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. On this Teacher Appreciation Day, CASE would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the hardworking teachers in Baltimore County. The vast majority of CASE members were teachers, and we recognize and appreciate the dedication and perseverance necessary to be successful in the classroom. So again, thank you, teachers. So tonight I want to talk about transparency. Um, currently, it's like one of the sexiest terms in our society. Uh, I googled transparency and came up with 12 and a half billion hits, billion with a B. Um, transparency is regularly touted as standard operating procedure in government at the federal, state, local levels, and yes, even by the school board. For the sake of this discussion, I'll use the definition of transparency found in Wikipedia which is transparency is operating in such a way that it is easy for others to see what actions are performed. Last month, Case uh, requested of this board that in the spirit of transparency, that they share the names of the two to three finalists for the BCPS superintendent search and bring each of them into our community for a day to meet with various stakeholder groups. This is common practice across the nation. Now, Case, you need to know, appreciates each member of this board and the hard work and dedication you have and continue to put into this search. But that said, tonight, Case is challenging this board to go on record to either commit to this transparent practice of meeting the superintendent finalists or maintain the current plan, which is to call a press conference and announce the permanent superintendent without any kind of introduction. The board here tonight needs to decide which of these choices exemplifies the level of transparency that you espouse. Case sees it as an easy choice. We think the members of this board should see it that way too. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Northeast area Education Advisory Council, Dr. Ryan Beveridge. Good evening and welcome. Hi, thank you. Interim Superintendent White, School Board Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, and Board Members, 
Thank you for giving me and the Northeast Area Advisory Council that I rep represent the opportunity to speak tonight. I would like to thank all of the board members for your time, devotion, and sacrifice that you've given to our school system. What most people may not understand is you all are paid very little for your time and effort that you give to Baltimore County Public Schools and that you are here to make our schools better. That is very commendable. Thank you to you all. I am also thankful now that we have a strong independent leadership from Board Chair Ms. Causey and Vice Chair Ms. Hen. For a while, my community did not have a voice on the school board, and I believe our community schools suffered because of that. Now that has changed because of Ms. Mrs. Hen's representation and hard work, and we in the community are thankful for her efforts. We are also thankful to you, Interim Superintendent White, on bringing stability to our school system after the tenure of the previous administration and previous majority board. They are not leading us now, and that is reason alone for optimism. Another reason for optimism is I believe our curriculum has improved under the, your tenure and that Ms. Megan Shea, the Director of Academics, is to, be, is to be commended. The fact that my boys read and get excited about such great authors as Roald Dahl and Mark Twain brings a smile to my face, and I am thankful Ms. Shea has improved our curriculum once she became Executive Director of Academics. Another reason I'm here tonight, besides to express my gratitude to the new leadership of our schools, is to discuss the overcrowding situation in the northeast area of our county. As we know, the money to build a much needed new middle school to reduce overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle has been denied by the State Senate. That leads students at Perry Hall Middle in a severely overcrowded situation. About 1,900 students presently attend the school. Let that sink in. 1,900 students in three grades. How crowded is that? It is so crowded that when I drive my son to school in the morning, it looks like the traffic of a major sporting event. Cars are backed up for several blocks. It is so crowded that my son cannot buy lunch in, at the cafeteria. The line is so long, by the time he gets his lunch and can sit down, light, lunchtime is over. And what, what time does he have lunch? 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning, my son has lunch because the school cafeteria keeps pushing the time up to accommodate increasing student population. Later in the day, my son's concentration seems to be lacking in his later classes, and I believe it's because he eats so early. Perry Hall Middle School is on track to be the largest school in the county with more than 400 students above maximum capacity. Please think about that for a second. A middle school with just three grades is on track to be the largest school in the county. That is why we at the Northeast Area Advisory Council agree with Vice Chair Julie Henn and Councilman David Marks in calling for an immediate boundary study for middle school. Unfortunately, that is not the end of the story for Perry Hall parents and students. The residents of the North East section of Baltimore County are very concerned about not only the present overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School, but the future overcrowding at Perry Hall High School. We are requesting immediate boundary study for the middle school and a boundary study for the high school within the year. The middle school is about 115 percent is at 115 percent capacity. The high school is at about 95 percent capacity. Thank you. And next we have from the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council, Mr. Clifford Collins, welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair. Julie Henn, Interim Superintendent of Relita White. I'm Clifford Collins, Chair of the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. I, be, I come before you this evening with, to issue a clarion call, urging this board to select the best candidate for a permanent superintendent for the Baltimore County Public Schools. We all know too well what the issues the new superintendent will face. They are discussed on Facebook, they are headlines in the print and electronic media, and they're debated during every board meeting. Some of these issues are fiscal oversight, management of the, board, of the school budget, transportation, stat, student discipline, the lack of air conditioning, and other structural problems in our aging school buildings. I recommend that the parents, I, excuse me, I remind you that the parents and stakeholders in Western, Western Zone are also very much concerned about those issues. You are currently in the final stages of selecting a permanent superintendent. We respectfully find, remind you that keep in mind our expectations and remember that your decisions 
will impact the present future of our students and school system in the years to come. I challenge members of the board to think about these three options that must be considered when making your final selection of a permanent superintendent. Option one, will you select a candidate who may require months or years to grasp the gravity of the issues while this school system continues to struggle providing quality education for our children? Or option two, will you proceed down the road previously traveled and select a candidate that may have his or her own agenda, vision, which is contrary to the immediate and long-term educational goals and objectives of the school board and express parents and stakeholder groups. How about option three? Will you select a candidate who has been an effective leader for Team BCPS over the past two years, is homegrown, knows the culture of our school system, is already managing solutions that are addressing the critical issues that we face, and most importantly, is committed to serving as permanent superintendent well into the foreseeable future. I conclude my remarks by reminding you again that you, get, you, get, that you give very serious consideration to choosing the permanent superintendent that has the qualifications, vision, and demonstrated leadership required to meet the challenges facing Baltimore County Public Schools in the years ahead. Thank you very much. We're now calling our public speakers, and our first speaker for this evening is Dr. Bosch Faroun. Good evening and welcome. Good evening to all. Today is the second day of the fast Ramadan. And although it's really known for fasting in the daytime from food and hanky-panky and stuff like that. But it, <laughs> it is really about family reunion. It's about self-purification, about taking care of others. And in that, I want to celebrate one American hero. His name is Omar bin Saeed. He was born in 1807. He lived in the area that is known now as Senegal, Mauritania. He was an educated, literate person. And when the big army came in, killed many people, took him as a slave, as many others were taken, went on the high seas for a month, and landed in Charleston, South Carolina. His captor was mistreating him, so he ran away, went to North Carolina, and the governor there realized that he was literate, educated slave. So he took care of him. He wrote a manuscript, and the Library of Congress has recognized that, and wrote many, many papers. He wrote many things in Arabic about Islamic culture, Quran Karim, and others on prison walls, which are not available at this time. Well, that's past, but what I'm trying to say, Muslim Americans today have their roots hundreds of years. Actually, I really believe that Christopher Columbus had Arabic navigators with him to guide him, uh, as Arabs were really great navigators. So what I'm trying to say to you is that Omar bin Saeed was eventually converted into Christianity. He had no choice. But for our children, we need to be recognized to others. I ask you to declare the month of Ramadan in the school system as the month of Islamic culture, because it's really about family union. It's about bringing family together. And I believe other communities had the same thing. You don't have to waste any money. It has nothing to do with other difficult issues you are doing. It's basically recognizing us. So when my granddaughter comes into the school system, 
she should not have to face what my sons have faced long time ago. I really ask you for that consideration, and thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Ferran. Our next speaker this evening is Ms. Deb Sullivan. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. First off, as former PTA president on all three levels, I would like to say happy Teacher Appreciation Week to all of the educators in the room, and we greatly appreciate your service. I'd like to say that I am in favor of the phase two audit, and I would like to think, hope that the entire board and Ms. White would also want a full and complete audit, which would disclose all of the facts to be in the open, and that should be welcomed. I'm also asking that all board members support the superintendent's search. Those undermining the process may not have faith in Ms. White. However, she may very well outshine any and all of the candidates because she is to, currently in the position and has walked those steps. Please allow the democratic process to continue. We would not want there to be a case of no bids allowed, as we hear so often of in the government. I'm simply asking for a fair and democratic process to be completed with the superintendent search as well as with the audit. And I would also like to ask, thank the board members who, despite public scrutiny, continue to fight for what's right for our children in Baltimore County Schools. You continue to be strong advocates. You have kept your eyes and ears open to the turmoil our schools are in, despite critics. You continue to believe that our schools can be saved for our children and our teachers because they are worth it. You have not turned a blind eye or a deaf ear to the concerns that we hear here and on the news and over the fence post, the concerns of our students and our parents. I'm asking that board members please work together as a team for all of the students of Baltimore County for a complete audit and throughout the search for Baltimore County Superintendent. I also thank those realizing that we do have problems in the schools, discipline, bullying, principals and teachers need more support and off, are often frustrated with the constraints that they face, overcrowding in the buildings and on the buses, and some buildings are in desperate need of repairs as we've heard time and time again, even with unsafe water. Reading and math levels have dropped and are below average in many cases. Students are pushed to graduate with little or no skills. All of these issues are in your hands as the board. Working together, you might be able to tackle all of these issues through your leadership. I believe that you can do it. I believe that you can be a team and you can be role models to the teachers that are under you and all of the students. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening and welcome. What does it mean to be college and career ready? That's something that we are tasked with as educators in every school system in the country. I'm speaking about Baltimore County, and I've said this before. I have two young children who are attending college right now, and I expect them to be responsible individuals who are independent and able to address their own needs and communicate their needs to others. When does it happen that these students become college and career ready? Does it happen at the beginning of elementary school? The end of elementary school? Beginning of middle school? I can tell you that when I was in middle school, I wasn't college and career ready. I wasn't even close. So then why are we asking our students 
when they set their foot in the sixth grade to be college and career ready. Especially those individuals that have the supports of an IEP or a 504. Why are we in such a rush to take those supports away because now they're in the sixth grade, the seventh grade, the 11th grade, or the 12th grade? The way that our students become college and career ready is for us to continue to support them with helping them to communicate their needs, to be responsible to address their own needs and compensate for their disability, not throw them to the wolves. I spent today, and I've been spending the better part of this year arguing with administrators, saying to me, the real world isn't going to accommodate them the same way we do. When are they going to be independent? They will be independent when we give them the supports and teach them how to be independent, not by taking them away. We need to give these students time and let them tell us when, we are when they are ready and not make that decision for them because they're now in sixth grade. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Tamea Moore. Good evening and welcome. Hi, my name is Tamia Moore. I'm a Baltimore County School parent. Um, my son and my daughter both attended Parkville High School. Both of my children have had ex the experience of being put out of school unfairly and inappropriately. When um, my son was in the 12th grade, he got into a fight with another student. The school's first response was to kick him out. They didn't try to resolve the conflict between the students or get involved or get me involved to problem solve or try any other interventions, even though this was his first time getting in any trouble throughout his um, entire uh, school career. Um, there didn't seem to be any process. Excuse me. We're not supposed to speak about specific student issues. We do have an avenue of redress for you if you want to keep your comments generally. Okay. Um, so. Basically, the process was, there wasn't any, um, any um, standards for the suspension or expulsion. Um, and he basic, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be speaking about him, but um, so they transfer the students to an alternative school. And um, you meet with a attendee, I mean, a assistant superintendent, and I'm sorry, yeah, but superintendent's designee, and then no reason for expulsion was given um, or any standards at all. Um, so due to this, I believe that the um, process and the circumstances in which they were um, put out of school were unfair and as required by the law. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Ms. Donna McDonough. We do have folks in the overflow room. Donna McDonough. Oh, she is coming? Okay, great. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Chairwoman Causey, members of the board, parents, teachers, and students. My name is Donna McDonough, and I am a grandparent of a future kindergarten student at Watershed Public Charter <laughs> School. I'm here tonight to support the founding board of Watershed. I'm a retired Baltimore County Public School <laughs> teacher, and I was interested in the concept of the school using 
environment, and arts as a driving principle. As I became more and more involved personally in the school, I did my homework researching best practices that are developmentally appropriate for all children. I encourage the board to pay close attention to the curriculum and outcomes of the school. Perhaps some of the ideas and practices are practical and able to be used by all schools and may help with achievement and behavior. The approach is simple. Young children are interested in science and the outdoors. Using those concepts to capture the hearts and minds of children will increase student achievement, reduce the need for discipline. All schools could benefit from more breaks outside and focus on high interest materials such as those that are being are planning to be taught at Watershed. I'd like to thank you for your support of the charter school and I encourage all of you to be have a chance to see the curriculum and what they're doing. I also would like to um, wish happy Teacher Appreciation Week to all my former colleagues and friends. Thank you. Our next speaker is Troy Mitchell. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Um, I have the distinct honor of introducing uh, Ms. Akisha Kelly, Ms. Amy Summers, and Ms. Debbie Carey, who's in the overflow. Uh, my name is Troy Mitchell, and we are a cohort of doctoral students from Notre Dame of Maryland University. <laughs> um, our policy that we would like you to consider is um, uh, gender nonconforming students. Sex, gender, and sexual orientation, they are not the same. According to key vocabulary described by the Maryland State Department of Education, sex is defined as the genetic and anatomical characteristics with which people are born, typically labeled male or female. Gender is defined as the attitudes, feelings, and behaviors that a given culture associates with a person's biological sex. Sexual orientation is defined as who you are physically, spiritually, and emotionally attracted to based on their sex, gender, and relation to your own. Gender nonconforming is an umbrella term uh, for students whose gender expression differs from stereotypical expectations of the sex they were assigned at birth. Students who do not identify with either traditional um, gender categories or identify as both genders are often called gender nonconforming, gender diverse, or gender expansive. Transgender refers to students whose internalized knowledge of sense of who they are are either male or female does not match their sex assigned at birth. We believe that it is important to recognize the value of everyone in the school community. BCPS Policy 100, Policy 5000, Standard D, and Policy 5470 all include language regarding the importance of inclusivity, equity, wellness, and safety. However, according to Gleason 2017 National School Climate Survey in Maryland, most LGBTQ students in Maryland experience victimization um, at school, with 56% of students reporting verbal harassment based upon their gender expression. 17% of LGBTQ students attended a school with a comprehensive anti-bullying harassment policy that included specific protections based upon sexual orientation and gender identity expression. Fewer than 20% had a policy or official guidelines to support transgender or gender nonconforming students. On April 9, 2019, Baltimore City joined Frederick County in having a specific progressive policy to address students who identify as trans transgender. Baltimore County should follow in their footsteps and create a specific and progressive policy of their own to address the needs and safety of gender nonconforming students. This gender dis discrimination um, affects students in specific ways that prevent them from fully participating in the school environment and impacts their ability to learn. The perceived sense of belonging has a powerful impact on students' emotions and motivation in their academic environment. Creating school cultures that are supportive, challenging, and accepting could help to foster engagement and academic achievement for all students. All stu Thank you. If you, and this goes for anyone, if you have written remarks that you want to um, submit to the board, uh, then our executive assistant can make copies for all of us. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. And also anyone at any time can email boe at bcps.org. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brenda Pfeiffer.
Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to speak in support of the work that this board has been doing since beginning its work together in December. For years, this school system was plagued with a board of education that was largely ineffective. Most members did not genuinely listen to or respond to the concerns of stakeholders. Little work was done to get information from the school system or even to ask meaningful questions prior to votes or decisions. And little, if any, effort was made by the majority of the members to hold BCPS accountable and create an expectation of transparency. It was as if most of the board members had forgotten the rightful order of things. The leadership of BCPS is to answer to the Board of Education, and the board members are to answer to the stakeholders and the citizens. A lack of proper oversight from many of the previous board members allowed our school system to go down the wrong path in many ways. However, thanks to the hard work and dedication of many advocates over a number of years, we now have this new hybrid school board, and I'm here tonight to commend you for the work you're doing. In just a few short months, you have accomplished an extraordinary amount of work. What's more, you have demonstrated a commitment to bringing much-needed accountability and transparency back to this school system. You are asking questions and expecting answers. You are discussing and debating decisions to ensure, to the best of your ability, that you are making decisions that are in the best interest of students and teachers above all else. And many stakeholders have been pleasantly surprised by how responsive you've been to the ideas, concerns, and requests that have been brought before you in the few short months since you officially began your work as a board. The work you are doing is difficult and time consuming. At times, it can certainly be a thankless task. So tonight I am here to thank you for your hard work and to encourage you to keep pressing on. Of course, any time you set out to serve as a leader in the community, there will be naysayers, those who try to detract from the work you are doing. But too many advocates work too hard to get this hybrid school board in place in the hopes of bringing back much needed oversight for BCPS. So don't let the naysayers discourage you from continuing on in the important work that you were brought here to do. Remember what you were elected or appointed to do ask questions, oversee the operations and the budget of the school system, and hold the leadership of BCPS accountable. If you continue to persevere and do your job well, you will accomplish exactly what you were brought here by the people to accomplish. Provide oversight and accountability, and bring integrity and transparency back to BCPS. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Showalter. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Tonight, there will be a discussion regarding boundary changes in the Northeast region. The proposition, as raised by board member Julie Hen on Facebook, is that 245 students that caused Perry Hall Middle School to be over capacity be redistricted to surrounding middle schools where a combined 500 seats are available. However, such a proposition does not come without very serious implications for those that would be redistricted to the surrounding schools. As evidenced by ratings that can be found at sources like Maryland Report Card for BCPS schools, none of the surrounding middle schools are equivalent to the quality of education provided at Perry Hall Middle School. How can the board, in good conscience, decide to compromise the education and futures of some of the students in the district? Our students deserve consistency and continuity in their education and to not be uprooted from their current community. And while the issue of home values may be of little importance to the board, it is of great consequence to the homeowners whose property values will suddenly become less than what they have paid for their homes. It is the intention of our, or is it the intention of our county leaders to see inevitable short sales and foreclosures impact the entire housing market in the region because of their decision to redistrict? Does the county intend to compensate effective homeowners for the loss in their home value or to reduce the high dollar property and school taxes they pay now or to provide a stipend to these residents so that they can afford to send their children to a private school in order to get the quality education this county is failing to provide to its residents. The impact of such a decision is far greater than just alleviating overcrowding and I implore you to find an alternative to addressing the overcrowding issue at Perry Hall Middle School. In preparing to speak to you this evening, I conducted some research on BCPS enrollment stats. I was unable to find anywhere a statistic that stated the number of stu students enrolled in a given school as part of a shared domicile. Further, there were no statistics stating how many shared domicile students receive special services or free and reduced meals. 
The 2018 BCPS budget states that the per pupil allocation for a middle, middle school student is $86, and for those receiving special services, the allocation is $281 per student. It makes me wonder what the total expenditure is for shared domicile students when my children, who should have the right to attend a quality school that isn't overcrowded because I am a homeowner in the district, may be in danger of being sent to a lesser quality school to accommodate these students. My suggestion to you is that when a school is over capacity, there should be a moratorium placed on the school shared domicile rule. Students with parents who are homeowners or leaseholders in the district should have priority over those who are living with a friend or relative in order to get a better opportunity for their child. While this may not solve the issue entirely, it is a starting point, and you, as the people appointed and elected to represent the residents of this county, have the power to begin here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Anna Gaffold. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, I'm Allison Haley. And I'm Ken Patterson. We also are PhD students at Notre Dame University. <laughs> Nelson Mandela once said that a nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. When translated into education, our school districts must be at the forefront of working diligently for those without natural advocacy. To bring it home to BCPS, our desire to build a global community should begin with the input, contributions, and continued support of those who are already global citizens, our ELL, or English language learner children. Are we supporting the whole child? What our district needs is a policy that supports the ESOL office and its mission as the ELL population continues to grow both nationally and in our own backyard. We are before you today to seek the board's support in creating a committee to draft a robust policy that demonstrates BCPS's commitment to equitable access to curriculum and instruction, social and emotional support, and services that empower the child and the families of ELLs. Currently, the approach to teaching and assessing ELL students is embedded in Equity Policy 0100 and Instructional Policy 6401 for Advanced Academics and Gifted Education. However, these policies do not address the specific needs of the ELL population. The lack of a design, defined policy, excuse me, does not accurately reflect what we believe is the commitment of BCPS toward meeting the diverse needs of this specific population. BCBS should go beyond curriculum acquisition and address unique sociocultural and linguistic needs of ELLs as they integrate, not only into the school system, but into our old, the local communities as contributing members. According to the Maryland Equity Project, Maryland's rate of ELL population growth increased by 4.9 percentage points over the 3.3 percentage points for the nation between 1995 and 2015. The Maryland Equity Project also cited that Baltimore County has the third highest number of ELL students in the state behind Montgomery and Prince George's counties. The Migration Policy Institute reported that while the 2017 Maryland graduation rate of 88% for all its students was comparable to the nation's average of 84%, only 45% of Maryland's ELL population gra graduated within four years. Versus, versus the national ELL graduation rate of 67%. This means that although the county is committed to the academic success of ELL students in spirit, more must be done to support them to overcome academic barriers that prevent them from graduating at or above the national graduation rate. With the largest concentration of Maryland ELL students, Montgomery County has both a policy and a resolution specifically addressing the needs of this population. BCPS is encouraged to learn from Montgomery County and be at the forefront of this trend. As such, we urge this board to commission the creation of a committee to draft a robust policy that affirms BCPS's commitment to our ELL students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And our final public speaker for the evening is Jesse Layson. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Interim Superintendent White, members of the board, parents, teachers, and students. My name is Jesse Leeson. I am the Executive Director of Watershed Public Charter School. I'm here tonight to give you an update on our progress. 
To date, we have received 339 <coughs> applications for 176 available spaces and continue to receive them every day. We received 65 applications for our 11 teaching positions and are in the midst of the interview process. We are excited to report that we have a phenomenal candidates from both within BCPS and teachers who are new to the district. We look forward to the board announcing the appointment of our principal later this evening. We took possession of our building in March and have been working around the clock to finish our building permit paperwork, which was submitted this week. We are currently ahead of our construction schedule. Our facility was previously the John Paul Regional School, a parochial school that was built in 1955 and recently closed in 2017. Like any building of that age, there are some minor asbestos work that we will be taking care of, although it was largely addressed by the former school. Three, the three closest BCPS schools are Dogwood, Featherbed, and Johnny Cake two of which are seriously over capacity. We have students joining us from all over the county, but around 60% are coming from the surrounding area. And we also have a significant number of students that have come back to the district from homeschool or private school. We will have a positive impact on school capacity in the West Zone and a wonderfully diverse student population. The school sits on 11 acres of property, which include a stream, a wooded area, and a micro farm that we have installed with the generous support of the Maryland Agricultural Agricultural Education Foundation and Teach Ag at Penn State. We've worked with Project Clean Stream to host a stream cleanup event on the property and are working with Blue Water Baltimore and the National Wildlife Federation on a large scale stormwater, pollinator garden, and rain garden project that will include grants and training for other local BCPS schools. Watershed was founded by teachers, not a large national company. We've written a full curricular framework that uses the Maryland Common Core and NGSS standards, but does so in a project based, multidisciplinary way. We will also augment our curricular materials with purchased resources in math and phonics and have consulted with the Office of Curriculum and Instruction about those choices. We have developed project-based assessments to augment the existing assessments built into those products, map testing and running records. We have completed quarter one curriculum materials for our teachers to have in hand as soon as they are hired. We were fortunate to welcome Ms. Pastor this week. Uh, to tour the school and see our curriculum. And we would again like to extend an open invitation to the rest of the board to do the same. We look forward to sitting down for the first time with Mr. Nussbaum um, and starting the important work of finalizing our contract with the district, a process which began in November of 2018. Thank you all for the important work you do for our schools and our students. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. That concludes our general public comment. We also offer the opportunity for the public to comment on proposed changes to policies. Uh, there were no speakers for policy 1110 or 1200. For public comment on proposed changes to policy 5500, Students Conduct, Student Behavior Code, I call forward Renuka Reje. attorney for the Public Justice Center. Thank you and welcome. This is for policy 5550, correct? Yes. Okay. No, excuse me. You you the first one that you signed up for is 5500. Okay. Um that's fine. Oh, I, I apologize. I thought it was 5550. It is. I'm sorry, there's a typo on my sheet. It is 5550. Okay, thank you. Student Behavior Code. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Reynu Garrege, and I am an attorney with the Public Justice Center, whose mission includes advancing equity and access to education for all Maryland students. Thank you for the opportunity to testify again about our continuing concerns about the legality of BCPS's proposed school discipline policies presented on Second Reader tonight and first I'll be speaking about uh, revised policy 5550. The current version of policy 5550, like its predecessors, fails to provide guidance on the specific responses recommended for each disciplinary infraction. Policy 5550 lists three categories of offenses and corresponding responses, including suspension, assignment to an alternative program, and expulsion. However, each list of offenses and responses is extremely broad, and there is no specification of what offenses can lead to what lengths of suspension. For example, the policy states that disrespect, such as refusal to do assigned work, 
or failure to follow direction may result in suspension but offers administrators no direction on what specific intervention should be used short of suspension, under what circumstances a suspension would be appropriate, and what length of suspension is recommended. We have seen the harmful impact of this lack of guidance in our work representing individual students in the county. In multiple instances this school year, Administrators have automatically imposed 10-day suspensions for Category 1 offenses, just because under Policy 5550 they could, even though that response was unnecessary in the particular case. State law requires policies that both allow for discretion in imposing discipline and are designed to keep students connected to school. Policy 5550 should be revised to provide more detail and direction on levels of responses and better facilitate a graduated consequences approach so that discipline is administered in a progressive fashion. The lowest possible response is used to address each incident of misbehavior as much as possible and more intensive responses are used when behavior is repeated consistent with state guidance. We have detailed this concern and others related to the policy in our written comments to the board. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. The next policy is policy 5560, students, conduct, suspension, expulsion, or assignment to an alternative education program. And our first speaker signed up is uh, Ms. Renuka Rege. It's, it's reggae, like the music. Reggae, mm -hmm. awesome, okay, great. Good evening, again, my name is Renuka Rege, an attorney with the Public Justice Center. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify about policy 5560. As we've stated in prior letters and presentations to the full board and the policy review committee, BCPS cannot discipline students by transferring them from their regular school to an alternative education program unless it abides by the legal standards and procedures governing extended suspension and expulsion. State law defines suspension and expulsion as disciplinary removals from a student's regular school program. And because a transfer to an alternative school takes a student out of his regular school program, it falls within that definition. This means that when a student goes before a superintendent's designee following a behavior infraction, the decision is not whether to give an extended suspension, expulsion, or removal to an alternative program. The decision is only whether the student meets the requirements to implement an extended suspension or expulsion, i.e., the student engaged in chronic and extreme disruption of the educational process that has created a substantial barrier to learning across the school day and other interventions have been exhausted or where the student's return to school would pose an imminent threat of serious harm to other students and staff. Only if the answer is yes may the student be sent to an alternative program. For up to 44 days in the case of chronic and extreme disruption or potentially for longer in the case of imminent threat. The latest revision to BCPS policy 5560 directly contravenes these requirements and on this issue represents a step backwards from prior drafts. In Section 6, it permits the designee to transfer students to an alternative school under any circumstance, even when there is no imminent threat of serious harm or chronic and extreme disruption. Under this version, a designee could force a student to transfer to an alternative school for an attendance violation or a single instance of disrespect or texting in class. Such transfers would be illegal under state law, and to the extent they are disproportionately applied to students of color or students with disabilities, they may run afoul of federal law as well. Blanket reliance on alternative school transfers as a disciplinary response is also bad policy. Research shows that every time a student changes schools, he loses three months of academic progress because of the disruption to coursework, the severing of positive relationships with teachers and peers, and the stigma that comes from being kicked out. Alternative schools also often do not offer opportunities available in mainstream schools, such as AP classes, languages, the full range of extracurriculars, the failure to provide the full range of courses available in regular schools also can cause students to not graduate on time or repeat grades. Removal to an alternative school might be necessary where a student's return to his or her regular school would pose an imminent threat of serious harm, but otherwise the costs far outweigh the benefits. Again, we've detailed this concern and others related to both policies in our written comments to the board. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. The next speaker on policy 5560 is Ms. Nicole Landers. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Hi, I thank you for your time. Um, I wanna say that I'm very thankful that you're addressing this and trying to trim it up and make it look better. I held the records in my hand of someone who utilized restorative practices for many years and killed 17 students in Parkland. It's a serious matter 
that students that are disruptive and not following the rules get moved. It's as much for the student that's disruptive to be helped as it is all the other students and faculty and staff in the buildings. I can tell you because I've held the records in my hand that his record looks like a nightmare of restorative practices for years that culminated into an act of violence, a severe act of violence. Now we have another one in Denver, Colorado today. This is a really serious matter and I appreciate that you're trying to trim it up. It is not unwise to move a disruptive student who's showing violent tendencies out. IEP 504 or not, they need help and they need to get moved. If we don't take action, we're gonna lose more students. We're multiplying Nicholas Cruz's in this county by the hundreds. I'm getting calls from teachers, from parents, daily. <laughs> One teacher who suffered under this restricted suspension policy, who was assaulted so severely, she had to crawl to safety out of her classroom. The student was then suspended for five days and sent back to her. That's pretty serious. I can't imagine if any of you had to crawl your way to safety from a violent student, whether you'd want to come back to work or not. But a whole classroom full of kindergartners watched this unfold while their teacher was violently assaulted and she had to crawl to safety. I appreciate that you're working on it. Please keep working on it because we, the onus of responsibility is on the board, on the staff, on the superintendent, and honestly on all of us as taxpayers because we are, we're funding this. This is our tax dollars at work. That's all I have to say. Have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Berger from Disability Rights Maryland. Good evening and welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Megan Berger. Um, I work with Disability Rights Maryland, an organization dedicated to defending and advancing the rights of students with disabilities. I'm here tonight on behalf of the many clients in Baltimore County that my organization has represented to urge the school board one last time to bring its discipline policies in line with the law. This is important and it matters because students with disabilities and African American students are being pushed out of school at higher rates than their non-disabled and white peers for the very same behaviors. In order to combat this inequity, it's imperative at a minimum that BCPS's discipline policies conform with state law. The main provision in policy 5560 that violates state law is the assignment to alternative education programs because it creates a separate disciplinary response, separate and apart from suspension and expulsion, and it states no clear criteria or standards for how the superintendent designee is to make such decisions. This is illegal and the provision must be removed from the policy. DRM, Disability Rights Maryland, has provided the board with written comments detailing the technical legal reasons why the provision is illegal, but this evening I want to talk about the real life ways that blanket, blanket transfers to alternative schools harm students. Um, I've represented students in the past um, where the, the student gets referred to our office and they're desperate for help. Um, they have a disability and a long history of failing grades and poor school performance. Um, they have a history of being sent to alternative schools. They've often failed at the alternative schools and are then retained and have to repeat a grade. Um, they then experience multiple suspensions and are sometimes you know, out of school and missing instruction for, for over 20, 25 days. Sometimes they're placed on half day schedules where they're only allowed to attend school for um, half of the day, and then they're ultimately placed in another alternative education program for behaviors. One particular education program is e-learning, um, and we have had clients on e-learning, they're sitting in front of a computer by themselves, these are young students, um, supposedly receiving instruction. Uh, one particular client was on e-learning and didn't even have a computer for the last month and a half that he was on that program. There was no engagement with teachers or staff. Um, 
it's not until our office gets involved that the student is referred for special education evaluations and assessments. Um, they're deemed eligible, found to have educational disabilities, and that's when the IEPs and the behavioral supports get put in place. That's when school staff gets eyes on this student, and they make the connections and the positive relationships with, this, with that student, and that's when things start to turn around. Um, we've represented many students. I can, I'll submit these, the, yes. the full written comments. Yes, absolutely, you can submit those. Our next speaker on Policy 5560 is Tamia Moore. Is Ms. Moore still here? We'll go check on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for checking on that. That concludes our general public comment. Thank you to all of those that have uh, come forward this evening. And that brings us to our next item for consideration, the superintendent's report. And for that, Ms. White. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to all. I would like to start this evening by thanking the BCPS family for your expressions of sympathy and for your condolences on my mother's passing. This has been, without a doubt, uh, one of the most difficult times in my life, but it has been made bearable through the outpouring of love and support from our community. So thank you, uh, BCPS. We are family. I said that uh, a little earlier in the week, and I do believe that we're more than a team. Uh, we are family. And I'm grateful for the hundreds and hundreds of you who have reached out to me in various ways um, through your notes and cards and text messages and phone calls and just... Um, it's been incredible and it's been overwhelming, um, but just wonderful. My mother was very special to me and she believed in the power of education and, and she championed my efforts toward becoming a teacher. Tonight, I honor our beloved teachers during this Teacher Appreciation Week. I'm grateful for our hardworking teachers who go above and beyond the call of duty for students every single day. Tomorrow, we will also celebrate School Nurse Day. Our school nurses do more than administer medications, which is a very important part of their job, but they do more than that. They provide care and support to all children and to staff members as well, and they connect with our families, and we are grateful for them. So please join me in celebrating our teachers, our support staff, and our school nurses for all that they do. So this is the season of celebrations, and I would also like to honor those who have been recognized recently. And I know in the back, and who said the Pledge of Allegiance for us, Omar Rashid was elected student member of the board for the 2019-2020 school year at a forum by his peers. Congratulations, Omar. Congratulations on your appointment. Uh, Mr. Douglas Handy, Director of Career and Technology Education and Fine Arts, was honored with the CTE Awards of Excellence Outstanding Secondary Change Agent Award. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Congratulations, Doug. Michael Sai, Coordinator of Athletics, received the Anderson Belenko Professional Development Award from the Maryland State Athletic Directors Association. So congratulations, Mike. Kristen Nielsen, English language arts teacher, teacher at Crossroads Center, was named the BCPS Teacher of the Year. Congratulations, Kristen. <laughs> Charlene Banky was named, uh, she's the principal of Honeygo Elementary School and was named the BCPS Elementary Principal of the Year. Congratulations, Charlene. Monica Sample is the principal of Overly High School and was named the BCPS Secondary Principal of the Year. Congratulations, Monica. These are just a few student and staff recognitions from the, this past month. Uh, so again, let's give them all a round of applause. 
Additionally, Mr. Walter Carter from Milford Mill Academy was recognized as the National Magnet Teacher of the Year. Let's give uh, Mr. Carter a round of applause as well. Was honored at the 37th National Magnet Conference that BCPS hosted last month. The conference drew more than 1,000 magnet educators, many of whom learned about BCPS magnet programs through the 22 school tours that we offered. Um, participants who came, they raved about our students and educators and how we inspired them and motivated them through um, our passion for learning and for our students' passion for learning and creativity and opportunities for student voice and choice. So I want to thank our wonderful central office and school-based um, staff who planned and carried out the conference uh, to great success. So thank you to all who were involved in that. I'm going to do my very, oh, thank you. Yes, let's give them a round of applause. I'm excited about this next portion. I'm going to do my very best to get through it, so please bear with me. Um, it is now my honor to announce a new scholarship opportunity in honor of my mother, um, who battled Alzheimer's disease for 15 years. Many of you have shared with me that you know someone or you have family members who have been affected or touched um, by this disease. And what you know, and if you've lived with this or if you know someone who's lived with it, that it can rob you of who you are and it can be extremely debilitating. And according to the data, this disease will reach ep epidemic proportions in the near future. I believe the answer to this problem is in the research and to dedicated individuals who really want to eradicate Alzheimer's. And I thank those who contribute to this work in the various ways that you do so. But I also believe that our young people, through their resolve, through their passion and their creativity, hold the answers to this challenge. You see, many times people will talk about our young people today, and they worry about our young people, but I don't. I believe in our young people, and I believe that our young people have the answers to many of these challenges that we face. To that end, through the Education Foundation of BCPS, my husband and I have personally established the Bernice H. Johnson Memorial Scholarship Fund for the promotion of Alzheimer's research. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I lost my place. <laughs> One of BCPS's female graduating seniors um, who demonstrates an interest in the eradication of Alzheimer's disease will receive a $1,000 scholarship. Requirements will re include an application and an essay, a minimum GPA of 3.0, uh, acceptance into an, an accredited two or four year college, in a field related to science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, a resume and two letters of recommendation. Eligible students are encouraged to apply through their school counselor by May 30th because we want to start this now. This, it is hoped that this, this small kind of contribution for my husband and for me will spark an interest. Um, and really draw, especially young women where we don't have young women in the field of STEM, um, and to eradicate this horrible, horrible disease. And I believe that many of us, if not most of us, have been affected um, by this. And so we do um, hope that this will also benefit a deserving young student. So it is our pleasure to do so, and it is my honor to even be able to speak my wonderful mother's name tonight. So thank you for your support of this. Um, thank you. And finally, behind every outstanding student is an amazing teacher. In the spirit of National Teacher Appreciation Day, which happens to be today, it is my pleasure to celebrate and honor the more than 9,000 educators who support and encourage our students. Tonight's video is one way that we are thanking and acknowledging every single one of our teachers. Class, class. Yes, yes, yes. Whoa.
what is cause and effect? What did you guys talk about? Teachers are one of the most instrumental people who help the growth of our BCPS students. They don't just teach, but they inspire our students to be problem solvers. And then you should be thinking about this question before we start our research. While all teachers are caring to me, one teacher stands out the most, Miss Clark. She stands out to me because she doesn't rush us into what she's doing. She gives us time to understand what she has to say, and she's an overall fun teacher. The teacher who inspired me to teach was my algebra teacher, Mrs. Hughes. Uh, she was very helpful and made sure that each one of her students understood. I adopted that with my teaching practices because I think there's nothing more important than making sure students leave your class knowing more than they did when they entered. I can think of a lot of things that make you special. My mom is the one who inspired me to be a teacher. I can remember when I was little, I would always beg to go into her classroom whenever I could. And she was one of those teachers that everybody loved, everybody wanted to have, and she still is. She made really great connections with her kids, and I knew that I wanted to be that kind of influence in children's lives as well. As you're looking at that real world problem... The quality of the teacher is probably the single most important thing in terms of student achievement. There have been many studies that show that that's the case, and I've seen it firsthand throughout my career. For instance, if you have a high quality JROTC program that wins the county championship 13 years in a row, I can assure you, you have high quality JROTC instruction happening. My Marine Corps instructor, his name is Gunnery Sergeant Allen, has really helped develop me as a leader for the past couple of years that I've been here. They've really helped prepare me to be of service for my community, state, and nation as I am going into the Navy in July. My youngest is uh, an eighth grader now at Cockeysville Middle School and we've been in uh, Baltimore County Public Schools since kindergarten and we've just had a wonderful experience with, uh, with the teachers uh, in, in all of these schools. Uh, I, I, I just can't speak highly enough of them and I, you know, some of them are just in my book, they are, they're all heroes, but some of them are just superheroes. They've been absolutely phenomenal. Now, every student is probably not going to be intrinsically motivated by every course he or she takes, but every student deserves that hook to come to school. And an enthusiastic, dynamic, well-prepared teacher can be that hook that gets students to come to school. As you get into a real-world problem, nobody's going to tell you, you must use substitution to solve this. You have to use your critical thinking and decide which is the easiest way for me to get it done. We celebrate our teachers, we celebrate our paraeducators as well who support teachers, and we celebrate our school nurses. Thank you, teachers, for all that you do. And Madam Chair, that's my Thank you, Ms. White, for that heartfelt report this evening. Um, I do want to step back just for a moment to Policy 5560. It was uh, pointed out that Ms. Margolis needed to speak on Policy 5560. Mr. Ms. Margolis, good evening and welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sorry after this happy news to come back to um, 5560. Um, my name is Leslie Side Margolis. I'm a managing attorney at Disability Rights Maryland. And um, initially, I want to make a point that although there is a perception in the county that teachers' hands are tied and that they are not able to use suspension and expulsion, in schools, that's simply not true. Um, in fact, since 2014, when uh, Maryland passed its current discipline regulations, the rate of suspension and expulsion in Maryland have actually increased, and that's absolutely true in Baltimore County as well. The rate has been going up, which raises the question about what role the policies 5550 and 5560 play in that process. So um, Disability Rights Maryland and the Public Justice Center have been working on this issue with Baltimore County for um, about a year. We've met with um, the administration and, and with council. We have sent letters to the board um, beginning in July of 2018. We sent letters in July, in August, in September, in October. We um, met with the previous policy review committee. We have come to board meetings. We have testified at board meetings sent a letter this week as well, and we're here. And we understand that um, as of today, we have been invited back to the policy review committee meeting coming up in a couple of weeks, and we appreciate that invitation. But um, 
you know, to date, the policies still do not comply with the law, and we feel that we have tried so hard to work with the board and with the county, and um, the policies are still out of compliance. So I, I come here tonight to say that we continue to want to work with you to try to resolve this. However, should we not be able to reach an, an agreement on this in a cooperative way, we will take every step we need to to compel the county to come into compliance with the law. We need to protect the rights of children in Baltimore County and to ensure that the county meets the requirements of the law. So um, this is our last time coming to you, offering to work with you, and I hope that at the Policy Review Committee we are able to resolve this in a cooperative way. Um, so that's our message tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item is the chair's report. And I just wanted to say today the board is pleased to acknowledge National Teacher Appreciation Day, which is observed on the Tuesday of the first full week in May. So that is today, as has been pointed out. This day is part of Teacher Appreciation Week, which is the first full week in May. And we are so grateful to the over 9,000 teachers and thousands of more teacher and student support personnel who are so dedicated to our students' success. We all have special memories of teachers who have positively impacted our lives. One of the many significant teachers in my life was a math teacher at my high school. He was a popular, respected, successful math teacher helping many students achieve who did not believe in themselves or their math abilities. Yet I did not spend a minute in his classroom. I had the privilege of him being my cross country and track coach all four years in my public high school in Alexandria City Public Schools. He saw potential in me that I did not see. I started out a scrawny, quiet girl. Through his teaching, the team of girl runners, that we needed to focus on the details of our practice, be determined, strive to improve and support each other, I developed into a fun-loving, resolute team contributor and team leader. I learned life lessons that still positively impact me today. Thanks, Coach Bob. So today and this week, let's all take time to remember in special ways those educators who impacted us in the past and those who are positively influencing our students today. A teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. This quote by Henry Brooks Adams really reflects the eternal ripple effects of what can happen in a classroom between a teacher and a child. And that's why we are here as board members, why we're here as educators in this system, is to make that connection happen every day in every school. We also want to thank our school nurses. As a parent of a student who had health issues, it's a wonderful feeling to know that they go to school and there's a competent, caring person that's able to step in and help. So we really have a lot to appreciate. We also wanted to welcome Omir Rashid, our, uh, the newly elected incoming student member of the board. His uh, application has been submitted to Governor Hogan and we encourage, encourage Governor Hogan to appoint him as soon as possible and he would join us after July 1. <coughs> The board appreciates, as was heard earlier in public comment, the interest in the superintendent search, and we're all encouraged by the community's interest in this important decision. We understand that finding the best leader for our school system is of vital importance, and we, uh, we will strive to keep the community informed of all stages in the process and decisions being made when possible. Through updates at meetings, press releases, and on our board webpage, bcps.org, and there's a tab under board leadership that is labeled superintendent search, we will be updating that. We're thankful for the tremendous input we receive from the public and from constituent groups through our extensive uh, executive search firm, Ray and Associates, their extensive and various avenues for input, all of which can be found on our uh, website. And rest assured, we will consider community input. At the same time, to secure the most qualified candidates, it is essential that the identities of those applying for the position remain confidential during the entire process, so their current positions are not jeopardized and they can be fully and fairly vetted by the search firm and by the board. 
This is the commitment the board and Ray and Associates has made to our candidates. These confidentiality concerns will require, and Maryland law allows, that portions of the decision-making process be completed outside of the public view. During those times, we as a board will consider community input. However, it will be in, uh, inappropriate for us to comment uh, or lobby for any individual candidates during the search process. In reaching our ultimate decision, we will be mindful of the background, strengths, and experiences of the candidates who apply, and will let the process guide us to make the best judgment possible. Please stay tuned as we will be giving an update later this week. And that leads me to my final remarks. It is amazing that it is May already, and the season of school celebrations has begun. We had our Career Technology Education Award Ceremony. I was pleased to attend and congratulate the students and the educators for their great success. Also coming up is the TABCO Retiree and Young Educator Awards Dinner this Friday. There's also school concerts, plays, dances, prom, sports championships, extracurricular competitions like the Robotics World Competition that was held in Tennessee last week, well represented uh, by several BCPS schools. These events are attended by many board members as we all continue to be engaged at all levels of the school system, but also in the community. And finally, the graduations are coming. The culmination of our mission accomplished. Students graduating, college and career ready, not only with a diploma, but with a resume or a industry certification or college credits under their belt. So it's for that reason, that mission accomplished, that we are all here and we continue to work hard. Thank you and that's my report. Our next item is the student board's report. For that, Ms. Adekoya. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and happy Tuesday. It pains me to announce that this will be my last, my second to last student member report. Teardrop, teardrop. <laughs> but just as much as it pains me, I am delighted to introduce Omar Rashid, the 2019-2020 student member nominee recommended by the students of BCPS. I'm confident that Omar will embody this position, paving the way for students he will serve. I'd also like to congratulate the newly elected BCSC officer team, Angela Chin, Samantha Warfell, Claire Carbell, and Carter Bohart. I have no doubt in my mind that they will continue to serve their peers, advocating for their diverse needs and wants at a local and systemic level. Thank you to the leading ladies of Chadwick Elementary for allowing me to visit their club and record a new episode of Hangul Halima. I enjoyed wrapping up our discussion on what it meant to not just have zeal, but display it in our present and future. In addition, thank you to the staff organization at Randallstown High School for allowing me to visit their school and record another episode of Hangul Halima. The Randallstown leaders of SAD, Students Against Destructive Decisions, are revamping what it means for us as youth to have fun, but also be cautious and responsible. Both clubs are doing amazing work in their community, and I'm quite impressed by their impact. It's May, Happy Mental Health Awareness Month. Last Friday, over 100 middle and high school ambassadors gathered at the Mind Over Matter Summit, where we engaged in learning about mental health. It was imperative that the students realize that their mental health is just as important as their physical health. The students listened to a keynote speaker who reminded them that they cannot simply go with the flow, but must be charged with the mission of being courageous and cutting off the chickens, simply because there are some things you just don't do until you're drunk or high. They were also able to participate in various workshops such as mindfulness and opioid substance abuse prevention. A huge shout out to the planning team for putting such an awesome event together. Again, I know the students who participated were heavily impacted and did not go back the same. Last but not least, I'd like to announce this. In the fall of 2019, I'll be attending the University of Maryland, Baltimore County as a Sherman STEM teaching scholar. The entire college decision-making process was very strenuous but eye-opening. I cannot stress enough how thankful I am for our BCPS community who supported me in a million and ten ways. As an aspiring educator, cough, cough, superintendent as well, I will be internally, <laughs> I will be internally grateful for my years spent as a BCPS student and student member. So no, nobody can get rid of me just yet. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adekoya. You're going to make us all cry, so <laughs> we're going to move on. Um, our next item is unfinished business, considerations of policy, third reader. <clears throat> Uh, members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following policies. Policy 2361, distribution of non-school materials. 
Policy 8132, which is policy manual availability, Policy 8250, board member responsibilities, and Policy 8330, minutes. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit I. No public comments were received concerning these proposed changes to these policies. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. No second is required. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. The next item of business is item J, new business personnel matters, and for that we call forward Dr. John Mayo. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hinn, Superintendent White, members of the board. I like board consideration for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits J1 through J5? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack and Mr. Offerman. So we'll have Ms. Mack and then Mr. Offerman as a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The next item is item K, new business, administrative appointments. I call on Ms. White to present the administrative appointments. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal Norwood Elementary School, Principal Owings Mills Elementary School, Principal Watershed Charter School, Assistant Principal Dundalk Elementary School, Assistant Principal Hereford Middle School, and Specialist Office of ESOL. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K-1? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Pasture. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to... Um, I'd like to recognize the following administrative appointments. When you hear your name, feel free to stand along with you, any friends or family members that you may have here, and we'll ask you who you have um, with you tonight. So first, we'd like to recognize Scott Conway, who will be the new principal of Owings Mills Elementary School. <laughs> Scott, Scott, do you have anyone here with you this evening? <laughs> Congratulations. Very nice. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Annie Hogue Friends, who will be the new specialist in ESOL. Annie, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Wonderful. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Janetta Jamin, who will be the new principal of Watershed Charter School. Janetta, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Lots of support. Congratulations. We'd also like to recognize Stephen Parsons, who will be the new assistant principal here for middle school. <laughs> Do you have anyone here with you tonight? And my new principal, Julie Delano. Very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Candace Stafford, who will be the new principal, Norwood Elementary School. Woo! 
Do you have anyone here with you, Candace? <laughs> Congratulations. And I'd also like to recognize Heather Swinder, who will be the new assistant principal, Dundalk Elementary School. <laughs> well, I see you have someone special with you. Would you like to do some introductions? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulations. And congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Uh, now it's item L, new business, action taken in closed session. For that, I call Mr. Nussbaum, our board counsel, to the table. As usual, I sit down, everyone leaves. <laughs> um, you just have that effect on so, us, Mr. Newsbaum. <laughs> every time. It's okay. I don't take it personally, thankfully. Um, Good so thing. Earlier this evening, the board um, considered several matters in closed session, including two appeals regarding confidential student matters in, their, in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, these matters were on the record as no request for oral argument was made. Their summary affirmance numbers 19-46 and 19-51. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm all the actions taken in closed session. Um, the, taken in closed session, excuse me. Microphone. Microphone. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, and the orders are sitting on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newsbaum. The next item is item M, new business, Northeast Area Middle School Boundary Study Discussion, and for that I call on Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, board members. Tonight, for your consideration, I present to you the following motion to initiate a Northeast Middle School Boundary Study. You should have a copy of the motion at your places. Whereas, the Board of Education of Baltimore County believes that every student in the school system should receive an education that maximizes his or her potential to become a globally competitive graduate, and whereas the board is committed to the success of every student in every school, and whereas the board is committed to providing for every student the highest quality 21st century education in a safe, secure, and positive environment conducive to high levels of teaching, learning, and student engagement, and whereas the board establishes school attendance areas in order to provide quality educational opportunities for all students and to promote the efficient use of school facilities and resources, and whereas the board shall determine, with the recommendation of the superintendent, the geographical attendance area for each Baltimore County public school, and whereas the superintendent may initiate a boundary study to develop recommendations for a boundary change to maximize use of available space in schools, and whereas enrollment at Perry Hall Middle School will exceed 120% of the school's state-rated capacity for the 2019-2020 school year, with more than 250 students enrolled over capacity, and whereas approximately 500 open seats are available in middle schools adjacent to Perry Hall Middle, and whereas the planned construction of a new Northeast Middle School, as well as the planned renovation and addition to Pine Grove Middle School, have been delayed indefinitely. Therefore, I move that the board direct the superintendent to initiate a boundary study of Northeast Area Middle Schools in order to make recommendations for a boundary change that will maximize the use of available space in these schools. And I further move that the boundary study be completed in time for any recommended boundary changes to be implemented and in effect for the 2020 through 2021 school year. Second. Um, Ms. Hen, you can speak to your motion. Thank you. I believe I've covered my points in the motion, as have several community members who have attended tonight. Perry Hall Middle is the most overcrowded middle school in Baltimore County by far. Um, there are available seats, and our policies um, 0100, 0200, 1280, and Rule 1280 all detail the precepts that I've outlined in my motion. Thank you. 
other questions and comments from board members? Mr. Kuhn and then Ms. Joes. Um, my question isn't about middle school. It's about the impact on high school delineation. Does, does the middle school feeder pattern change or, or will these kids still go back to Perry Hall High School? Sure. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Excellent question. Um, this would not impact the high school boundaries as boundaries are school specific according to our processes. So those patterns would not change. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, my question is going to be to Dr. Brown, if you could please um, step forward. And also to Ms. White um, to further elaborate on what Mr. Kuhn said. Does that impact the high school? And um, my son goes to Perry Hall Middle School. So I have a vested interest in this as well. But I want to see how it's going to impact the other schools. And to be equitable to everybody, I, I would like for you to speak on how the process is done by BCPS. Sure. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And, and I, I really want to harken back to something that uh, uh, Mr. Mark said at the, at the beginning, I think it's really important that we give full consideration to this process. Um, there are two sides to this issue, and I think we heard from Ms. Showalter as well, that um, while folks who live in the center of a, of a boundary area often are quite um, enthused with the idea of setting up a boundary, those who live at the periphery and, and who are going to experience the change often feel quite differently about it. And these processes, um, and, and let me be clear, um, I, I do think it's accurate to say that, that Perry Hall Middle School is grossly overcrowded. There's a reason that we advocated uh, for capital projects in this area. And, and I believe in the long run, the capital solutions are, are really the, the solution for Perry Hall Middle School. That being said, um, this is not a new issue. We've talked about this before. About two years ago, I actually came to the board and presented on another option, which was um, annexing, which is actually faster <laughs> than, than a boundary process and a lot cheaper than a, a boundary process and also temporary, <laughs> whereas boundaries are permanent. So um, I think if we're going to give full consideration to this and attentive to the, the timeline, we still have time maybe to come back and to talk through the options before we commit to maybe one pathway. And I think given um, the potential consequences for folks in the community, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that, I think it's really worthy of us giving our full attention to it and weighing that before we wander down this road and maybe ask people to go through two boundary processes almost back to back. And I'm just really a little concerned about what that experience will be like for members of the community. So uh, Ms. Hand is absolutely right. Um, boundaries that are established for middle school are for middle school. Now, that may impact what elementary schools feed in to that. Because if I change the middle school, where you are in an elementary then may end up feeding to a different middle. It will not impact the high schools. Uh, the high school boundaries are separate. Um, but you should maybe hear some logic in that, that you know, logically we like to do our elementary boundaries first, establish them, then we can do a middle school boundary, do our best to try to align those so that you know, your elementary feeder pattern, your middle school feed pattern come together and then ultimately feed up into the high school. And we had a gentleman earlier who said, wow, you know, high schools uh, are going to be overcrowded in this area as well, which is part of why when uh, we heard uh, from Sage Policy Group, there was advocacy for Lock Raven as a solution because it provides additional seats for Perry Hall, much needed additional seats that just simply don't exist. And we can't boundary our way out of Perry Hall right now. Right. So um, that being said, I, I'm not following the 500 number because the schools that are immediately adjacent to Perry Hall only have about 100 additional seats. I think you're probably including stemmers in the math, okay? And this is where it gets tricky <clears throat> because when we do boundaries, typically we look at the buildings that are right next door because to get to those seats at stemmers, we have to go through at least one building to get there or create an island 
you know, where we, we say, hey, there's this island, and then I'm back to an annex. <laughs> it's, it's a lot cheaper just to do an annex and say, well, you know, let's send these kids over here for, for a little bit. Um, my experience has been, and I think we heard it, and if you look back over time, the greater the perceived disparity between two schools, I don't care if it's based on, on academics, based on SES, based on race, I mean, we heard this loud and clear as a Route 40 delimiter for, for the Southwest area. The greater the disparity, perceived disparity between two schools, the more energy that tends to come up in a boundary process. We're asking people to make changes that are very difficult. We're asking people to think about um, oftentimes longstanding relationships with their community and how those changes, and, and sometimes that can cause quite a rift within a community. That's my concern right now, that, that I, I would really prefer us, rather than voting today, to have an opportunity to come back and let's talk about what these options could look like, who would be likely to move. I mean, based on 1280, we look at typical geographic features. You know, again, if we're talking about trying to get to Stemmers, the shortest pathway to Stemmers is frankly through Middle River, mm -hmm. which means that students would have to move out of Middle River to accommodate students coming in to Middle River from Perry Hall. It requires two school communities to change. And then we'd come back, likely within a year, because, and Mr. Smith, our, our best estimate of when uh, the Nottingham site would be available? We're, we're at least a year out now, but that could change as we continue our okay. conversations with both our state and local funding agencies. So, so if we think about this, we're talking about a boundary that would go in place in 2021. A year later in 21, 22, I'd have to be initiating a new boundary process for an opening in 22, 23. We wouldn't even get one cohort of students through this process. And again, this doesn't take away, I'm not trying to take away from the urgency or, or the sense of overcrowding. I just want us to fully think about what we're asking families to do. This is a tough ask. We're asking people to move one direction and then likely move back a different direction at a later point in time. And there was just a boundary study done for the Honeygo Elementary because my kids moved from Chapel Hill to Honeygo. And, and yes, some of these communities have already be, been moved and we could be moving some of these families three and four times during their students' careers. It, it, it just, I think it's worth some more thought before we... What kind of solutions would you propose because there is an urgency, there is a problem, and um, you know, I know there's a process, and what typical time frame does the annexation versus the boundary study take? So boundary process takes about 15 months to get through from, from beginning to end, um, which is why I say we have a little bit of time here that we could consider. We, do, we don't necessarily have to make this vote today. We could postpone that, come back and talk about the options and, and, and things that could be considered. Um, and annexing uh, could happen much faster. We could just look at geographically what would be the most likely area to move and we could move that area simply straight to Stemmers um, and, and not impact, say, the Middle River community or you know, another route would move kids through three different schools to do it. We, we could limit the, the number of families impacted and it's temporary and it can be undone. Uh, so uh, you know, that's a second option and I think uh, for the sake of transparency with the community, I think it'd be helpful for folks to know who are we talking about moving? Who would be the most likely to move? And which is why I think we should come back and, and maybe walk through that based on numbers. The other thing is when we imp Im implement a, a boundary, 5140, policy and rule 5140, um, phases that over time. So initially we're impacting sixth graders and then seventh graders and then eighth graders. So again, in the model based on what we anticipate in terms of funding, kids who enter sixth grade in one building likely wouldn't complete their middle school time in that same building um, without experiencing another boundary process. We throw in sibling transfers, et cetera. Um, it, it becomes a little complicated. So again, I think it's just worth a longer conversation than that, and, and I don't have slides or whatnot ready to talk about that. Um, 
when we talk about um, moving forward, you know, we do progressively look at relief strategies, and, and I think what I would like to do is come back and talk about a progressive set of relief strategies that have been considered, what our options are. Oh, absolutely. People buy houses in Periol for specific schools, and then you tell them you're going to ship them to school A, B, C, and it's going to be from this board. And, and don't mistake me. I, I absolutely believe a boundary will be necessary in Periol, but I would prefer to do it one time. I would prefer to ask families in the community to only think about that once. Um, but again, I would like to, to come and actually talk about, hey, option one is we move through a boundary process, option two, we look at annexing, option three looks like this. Um, none of the above are ideal right now. Let, let's, let's be clear, and I think uh, from my seat, uh, probably the most important thing we can do is advocate for adequate funding. Um, we need to get these projects back on track and get them back on track yesterday. So. I would have to echo what Dr. Brown has just said, and I just, uh, won't repeat everything that he said, but again, a capital solution is the solution. Um, I, I think that that is the best solution. Now, certainly, we've recently learned that a capital solution is kind of off the table for right now. But again, um, we do share the board's sense of urgency to relieve uh, this uh, capacity and to make sure that we are relieving overcrowding and we're creating more capacity rather. And so we want to make sure though that when we're, we're sensitive to students and student movement and families and making the adjustments and what that will mean and how many times we will need to make those adjustments given the disruption to um, a child educational program. So we are very sensitive to that. We do have a pretty robust system when we, when we talk about boundary studies and the boundary process. We would just like to be able to propose uh, responsible solutions. Again, none of the solutions without the capital project will be ideal, but just the various options for the board to consider prior to making the decision. Or, Again, I don't believe that the board has to make the determination tonight, um, but we do understand the sense of urgency and we share in that sense of urgency. And I would suggest, um, you know, based on, on uh, the superintendent's direction and and collaboration with the uh, board leaders, uh, we can we can accelerate this a, as need be. So, to okay, answer Ms. your question, <laughs> thank you, um, thank you, Dr. Brown, thank you, um, Ms. White, Ms. Mack. Um, Dr. Brown, as you know, because I've seen you at many meetings, I'm very familiar with the boundary process, but I don't know that I'm as familiar with the annexation process. Is there a brief description you can give us? Sure. Um, Annexing, again, boundary processes, when you think about them, they're, they're um, governed by 1280. Uh, again, they take about 15 months to get through the process. They are, by uh, their very nature, are permanent. And so when we think about uh, a process of, um, again, escalating components of a re relief strategy, the top of that, that food chain, and I'll bring that next time as a, as a slide, is a capital project. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff we try to do within a building first, and then sort of in the middle ground is this annexing. And annexing could be saying, oh, kids in this grade will be served at this building. We have a number of kindergartens across the system that are, or pardon me, pre-Ks that are annexed to another building because of lack of available space. There have been times where grade levels have been annexed to another building because of lack of available space at, at a current building. So it's a temporary solution to, to buy time. Um, and it doesn't, again, the board can vote on that. I mean, all of these things sort of fall within the board's capacity to make, make a decision about a pathway forward. I'm just suggesting that if you're gonna make a decision about a pathway forward, let's have all the information on the table so that you can say these are the pros and cons if we do a boundary. These are the pros and cons if we choose to do an annex. These are the pros and cons if we try, try to do something else in, in, in the short run. Um, and again, I, if anything, I would encourage you all to, to unify around the idea of we need to get our capital plan back on, on, on track because ideally in this area, we would start our elementary schools because there's additional elementary relief. We'd get those elementary boundaries set and then come do the middle school boundary because, the, again, the elementary boundaries will inform the middle boundary as we move forward. I have just another question. A parent spoke tonight and talked about shared domicile and the impact on overcrowding. Do you ever include that in any type of annexation or boundary study looking no. at 
sh students in a shared domicile? The things that we typically look at in, in a boundary process are students who reside in a, in a given school. Just at, at face value? At face okay. value. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm keeping track here of who has already spoken and who has yet to speak. So working down that list, then I would have uh, Mr. Offerman and then Ms. Rowe. Uh, and then I saw your hand for your second time. So well, Mr. Offerman first, uh, yes. Ms. Rowe. Uh, I, I think I'm getting a, a better grasp on how on, on the complexity of this. Uh, is is uh, my hair gray over time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is uh, the 2021 20, school year proposed deadline in this in this uh, motion reasonable? So, recently, um, the board was informed of our intent to do a boundary for Pleasant Plains. Uh, the Pleasant Plains community is also overcrowded, and frankly, we're pretty much out of options to address any additional overcrowding at Pleasant Plains. So there was a sense of urgency to try to address that. That is the plan fall boundary process. To be perfectly transparent to the board, the, the work that we do to put up a boundary process uh, is extensive and, and it requires all hands on deck. It involves many offices. It, it, it's about a thousand hours of work to, to try to get one of these off the ground uh, when we look across the system. That being said, and that's not even counting what happens at the schools. I'm just talking central office work. Uh, we're not talking about what it takes uh, for schools to have welcoming, ish, you know, and all that. Um, so it is possible that we could do this, but we can't do both. So if we do the Perry Hall, then we'll have to delay the Pleasant Plains because we simply don't have the 2,000 hours worth of capacity and staff to be able to do both of those at the same time. And, and I'm just being utterly transparent and honest to, about that. And, right. and it's a tough choice because both communities have high needs. Um, I, I think we actually have more options in Perry Hall than we do in, in Pleasant Plains at this point in time. Thank you. So. Ms. Rowe. Mr. Sayers, um, can you tell me, based on the changes in the um, funding and the lack of forward funding, that if we receive over the coming years approximately the funding we're receiving, when would a new Nottingham Middle School open based on the current priority order? Because I assume that timeline is changing since we're not forward funding and since we're not getting $100 million a year, I'd like to know when do we expect this new middle school to open? And I'm not that, Mr. Saris, and he's and much better looking, but I'll try to answer this. Okay. Yes, we welcome you, we, Mr. We, Smith. We can't put a definitive on that because we have a capital plan, but how the funding is allocated is based on the decision that, this, that, the, that the county executive and the county council make. So we can't tell you today what that's going to be. Based on what we've heard thus far, as I indicated there, we're about a year delay. Mm -hmm. based on what the, the, the county executive share with this board and with this, the Senate delegation and the House delegation. So, so where does a year delay put us from where we would have been? We're one year behind. It was going to open in 2021-22. Now it's going to be, 22. based on what we have now, 22-23. But I, we, Mr. Saris, no, I can tell you definitively if that's going to happen. It just feels like if the funding comes together as we continue to advocate, advocate with uh, our funding agencies, state and locally, as well as our communities, hopefully we can get the funding that we need in order to move forward with the capital plan and for funding. So my understanding is that part of the qualification for state funding for a new building has to do with the capacity of surrounding jurisdictions and that there was a plan to close Golden Ring in order to build the new middle school. Is that something that the state will approve or is that kind of up in the air, putting this whole new middle school project in the air for state funding? I guess I'm trying to gauge whether this new middle school is going to happen at all because if the surrounding areas have capacity, could the state come back to us and say, do a boundary study because you have capacity? Yeah. So the, the capacity that Ms. Hen cited um, it included STEMers, which again is not immediately adjacent. 
Um, it also didn't include Ridgely in, in the math. A and when we were looking at Pine Grove as a potential solution, uh, the lion's share of the Pine Grove seats are actually aimed for Ridgely uh, and Dumbarton. That's not to say that, that there aren't some seats that could be afforded to, to Perry Hall, but if we were to try to go that direction for a boundary, uh, we'd have to have Ridgely at the table and likely Dumbarton as well as part of that conversation. And, and when you put that math together, all of a sudden these seats start evaporating. The other thing is when we look at, at um, seat availability, Miss um, Hen's number is based on today. It's not based on growth, and our schools are growing. And so when we put together the justification for a project, that's seven years out. Well, if I go seven years out, you know, there's a, a <laughs> We're at a huge deficit across the region any way you cut it. I, I, I don't care if we leave stemmers in, we bring stemmers out, we put Ridgely and, and Pine Grove in or take them out, we just don't have enough seats. There's, so I'm confident that, that you know, we have justified this, the seats for these projects as we move forward. Ms. Hen and then Ms. Joes. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Brown, for speaking to us. I, I was aware that this was a last minute agenda item, and I know we weren't, the board didn't ask you to prepare, so thank you for taking our questions and speaking to us on this. The boundary study process, and I've gone through this as a board member on the periphery several times now, is one of the most amazing, outstanding processes in BCPS. It truly is remarkable, and when Dr. Brown says a thousand hours of effort go into it, I, I see that, because clearly, um, a lot of effort goes into it, and this is not a, a request I'm making lightly for the board to seek this. It is an amazing process. It is what Perry Hall needs. Um, what led us to the capital project of the new Northeast Middle School was the gross overcrowding of Perry Hall Middle um, and the longevity of that. I mean, Perry Hall Middle has been grossly overcrowded for Dr. Brown would have the numbers, but a very long time, for years. Um, this is not a new problem. It's one that led us to a capital project that was so desperately needed to open in 21. Now that that's not happening, we've got to provide some relief to this school. They have lost um, athletic field space. There are relocatables on the majority of the, the field space now. Um, the school is busting at the seams, not to mention there are going to be over 2,000 students for a middle school. So I'm open to other suggestions. I will say that, you know, instinctively the boundary process is an amazing one. It's what this community has needed for a very long time. Um, the need was not created overnight. It's probably a process that should have been done many years ago. Um, and we do need to do something now because there is no certainty with the new Northeast Middle School um, project. We've got to get these kids some relief. And if we need, I understand we need to look at Ridgely. They're right behind Perry Hall in terms of overcrowding. We need to consider, you know, seats at Pine Grove. My confidence is in Dr. Brown and his team to do this right. And that's why I'm asking for a boundary study process, because I know it will be done right. I know the level of community engagement that's included in this process, and it is phenomenal. I have every confidence in this process that all voices will be represented in it, and that the solution that this process will result in will be the best for our kids. So I'm asking you to support this, to move forward with a boundary process. Um, again, we've got the right folks in place. This process is down to a science. And we've done it before, and we've done it extraordinarily well. So again, thank you, Dr. Brown, for, for addressing the board members' questions tonight. I appreciate it. Ms. Jose, thank you. So given the complexity of this whole boundary process, um, I would like to move that we postpone this matter until the superintendent and Dr. Brown's office can give us a preliminary evaluation of this boundary study and its impacts um, so we can make a more informed decision as a board. Ms. Joes, um, that's currently out of order because we have a motion in a second already. So we'll have you to, can, okay. we'll have to address can that. Can I amend her motion? Excuse me? Thank you, Andy. So, okay. A motion to postpone. Okay. That's how I heard it. Yeah, can you yeah, restate to postpone that, please? so we can get a preliminary evaluation and maps from Dr. Brown. Um, is there a second? Second for Roger. Okay, um, so is there discussion on the motion to postpone? 
Um, she had her hand up first. So we're now speaking to a new motion. So we're starting over with the number of times that board members can speak to the motion, which is so just to be clear that we're now speaking to Ms. Joe's motion to postpone. Okay, Ms. Rowe. So it, um, if we approve this motion to postpone, um, can Dr. Brown come back and can the school system, other personnel who may be needed to come back with a variety of proposals to deal as far as annexation or as far as what is necessary to solve this problem of overcrowding in the short term? So, um, Ms. Rowe, as I stated earlier, the decision, I, I don't believe the decision to do this has to be made today. I believe the board has time without jeopardizing a 2021 timeline, being sensitive to that, uh, because I certainly would want um, the students and the families in the community uh, to be afforded to have that whole process and the opportunity to, to think about um, special permission transfers, magnet applications, et cetera, all, all the things that go into that work. So uh, I do believe we, we could accomplish that and, and give, again, the board full information to be able to make decisions about their options uh, moving forward. So how long do you think that would take? Well, again, I, I put it to the superintendent and the board chair to, to direct that, but I think we could expedite that fairly quickly. Wait, again, I, I know that more, usually it does take several months, but we want to make sure that we are um, expediting the process and getting it to the board as soon as possible. I'm hesitant tonight to sit here with a, uh, an absolute date, um, I but I, I defer to you, Dr. Brown, in terms of how long it might take because you know the process. I, I can safely say that this isn't the first time we've thought, of, thought about this area, mm -hmm. which puts us at a little bit of advantage to, to, mm -hmm. to putting something together. And so, um, while two weeks may be fast, I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't be back to to the to the board in June, and without jeopardizing the the 2021 deadline. Exactly. Or, it it or would require a little bit of compression on the front end. There there's some places where we we could do that. And I would um, echo that just the the board's consideration in that matter. That way we can offer various options um, for the board's consideration um, as we're moving forward, so that you have all the information that you need to make the decision. Excuse me, we had Mr. Kuhn next, and then I have some comments, and then Ms. Hen. Yeah, uh, Dr. Brown, my, my question was simply about timing as to when you could come back and address us with the information. So you're, you're saying uh, our June meeting, I think, which is like the 11th, is that enough time? I Ms. Gover, when is our next meet? Uh, what is the first meeting in June, please? June 11th. I, I believe that we could be back by June 11th with an outline of, of two or three pathways forward. All right, thank you. Thank you, and then I did just uh, wanna make a few comments. I do know that the Perry Hole Middle School is incredibly overcrowded. I've seen it myself going in the locker rooms and there's just not enough lockers. So students, uh, book bags, clothes, laptops are hanging out on the floor. You know, the whole issue with the cafeteria starting early, it really puts pressure on the school to provide the highest level of um, academic engagement and achievement for our students. I've also been to Pleasant Plains, and I've seen the overcrowding there. Um, so obviously that's a very important school too. Um, and I've been to Ridgely Middle, and while they have some capacity, they do not have enough at this time. That's why they were slated to get an addition. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ridgely Middle is at capacity also. So we are in a predicament and and I do share the concern of the community and uh, board member Hen and Councilman David Marks that conversations have been taking place for 2012 at least that I'm aware of, 2014, 2013, 2014. So there is um, action that needs to be taken I believe. Um, my question is just real quickly, how many relocatables right now are at uh, Perry Hall Middle School? I believe there are 10, but let me get back to you with a verification. Right. Okay, 10. And um, the other issue is with uh, how the different types of relief strategies uh, will be considered. 
Um, you talked about progressive relief strategies, also annexing. Um, I think one of the suggestions that I would make is uh, that there be some ad hoc committee that's working with your folks, uh, with some folks from the community. We know that we have heard from them over the years and really, you know, even here on the board with having members that are in that community can be very helpful. So I would um, make that as a recommendation to be considered by the board as uh, we consider different, different options. Um, so those are my remarks and where we were next. Mr. Hayden has not yet spoken, so I'm going to put him to the top of the list currently. Mr. Hayden. Thing other than knocking over soda cans of what I'd like to talk about is the fact that this is deja vu. We've been here before. We've been here a number of times before. When I was on the board my first time around, we closed a whole bunch of schools which means we altered where students went. It was something that's somewhat disconcerting, and you find almost in order the people who get most concerned about it, and I'll leave board members out of it for a minute, are uh, the parents, the teachers, and the students going downhill there. The students, because we have a great staff always managed to get through, get a good education, learn what we had to learn, and get through. Was it the best of all worlds? No. Uh, but it worked, and it worked because we have great teachers. We have great staff out there. We make things happen, and we have done this before. And to say that this is some mysterious circumstance that's coming up, it's not. We have done this many times. And uh, if my memory was better, I could tell you how many. But it's double digits, and double digits uh, in the 30s probably, or if not more, when we've been able to go into schools, handle situations like this, working with good staff, and working towards a solution. And making people understand that what we're talking about is improving education for everybody, and run to charging pell-mell into something and spending a whole bunch of money because, geez, we're, uh, we're, we've got a problem here. Well, how long will the problem last? I mean, student populations are known to do this as well as go up. Uh, I remember when I first came on the board way back when, we had 130,000 kids in the school system. 130,000 kids. We went from 130,000 down to yeah, around 70,000. It was not the end of the world going down. We redistricted. We closed schools. We saved over $100 million in things that we did that went back to students at that time. But it's a matter of not getting lamb blasted into a, a direction that's going to say, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. We've got to do this. We have got to look at it in a reasonable manner. And I think the reasonable manner is to have uh, Ms. White, have Dr. Brown get involved, do the normal study that we would do, and lay out the, 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 the direction that we would take to make this happen. Again, running into something and making a decision like this would be uh, just uh, not good news for the school system and not good news for any money, amount of money we would spend, which I guarantee you, the more we rush it, the more it'll go up. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Is there anyone else we are speaking on the motion to postpone? Ms. Rowe. I'd like to amend the motion to postpone to include postponing it to June. It's not part of the official motion. It was just conversation. So your, can you restate your amendment? So the, the, the motion is to postpone the item. I would like to amend the motion to state that we are postponing it to June. The first meeting in June at June 11th? First meeting in June, yes. Ms. 
Do you accept that friendly amendment? And who seconded your motion? Mr. Hayden. Ms. Jones has accepted the friendly amendment. Is there any discussion on that? Uh, let's vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment to motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion to amend carries unanimously. Is there any other, uh, excuse me? I just wanted to indicate I'll that I'll my motion. Not vote on, the, on this Sorry. one because that's no, okay. <laughs> it's all right, but it relates to boundaries, so, so she should not vote. So Mr. Nussbaum has clarified that the student member of the board is not able to vote, so that vote was 11 to zero, which is unanimous. And Mrs. Causey, I withdraw my original motion. So Ms. Hen is now withdrawing her original motion. Um, so. Point of order. You can't withdraw the original motion when we have to vote on the motion to postpone, and if that carries, then the original motion is postponed. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion before we vote on the motion to postpone this issue to the June 11th meeting? I thought we just did. We just no, voted. On we it, voted on the amendment. Oh. Now we're voting on the motion with the amendment. Okay? I'm confused. We're voting on the motion to postpone to the June 11th meeting. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries 11 to zero. So, um, Ms. White, if you can have uh, work with staff, and uh, I, I would make a suggestion to include maybe the board members that have the, uh, the um, Ms. Hen, who represents 5th District, and also Ms. Joes, who also lives in that area, that um, could be involved as, as the uh, I would suggest that the that the board so that the full board will have information at the same time that the staff would pr put together the kind of recommendations and options and then present uh, to the board at the same time. That would be my recommendation. I can understand that, but I don't need to. I I see where the elected member of the board that represents that district to have specific input and knowledge and um, other board members that have specific knowledge in that area. Um, so, Ms. Joe's. Or, so go ahead, Mr. Hayden. Um, I don't understand your reluctance there because, again, one of the strengths of the board, not the most recent old board, but the older board, was that board members got involved in everything that they had time to get involved in. And it didn't have to be explicitly their district. Board members were appointed from districts and in those appointments, yeah, they were responsible for talking about issues there, but they realized that their number one responsibility was to the boys and girls of Baltimore County schools. And there was no, well, you came from that district, so you should only think about that. That is so wrong, it's unbelievable. We have to think as a board about all the boys and girls in Baltimore County. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. We absolutely do as a board think about the boys and girls of Baltimore County as a whole when we make our decision. Um, although there are some subject matter experts like we have in committees and in the in the districts in terms of being elected. So but that we'll allows that them to learn more as they get involved. Me. Excuse me. So we'll leave that up to Ms. White and staff to coordinate with uh, the folks that would be helpful. Okay? All right. Thank you. And that brings us to our next item, which is item N, new business contract awards. So for that, uh, I turn it over to uh, Building and Contracts Committee Chair, Ms. Hen. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. Items N1 through N15 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N15? No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Uh, is there any discussion on any of the contract items? I did have a question about the uh, contract related to the uh, relocatables. If 
Mr. Saris or could come forward. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Dixit. So one of my uh, questions related to this uh, is in terms of the competitively bid contract for the purchase of relocatable classrooms, we currently have both leased and purchased relocatables. Is that correct? That's correct. So this contract is only for purchasing? There are two exhibits in front of you. One is for lease modular classroom and the other one is for the purchase. So there are two different exhibits. Okay, and so for the leasing, how long is that lease uh, required? Lease could be for any number of years. There is a charge we pay for the installation and first year of lease cost. After that, there's another charge that is just for the lease amount for any number of years that we want. So if we purchase a number of uh, relocatable classrooms and then we also lease a number of relocatable classrooms and we continue to advocate aggressively as we all have done um, and we do get our construction funding, then are we able to back out of the leases um, as we hopefully get all of those students into classrooms and, and out of the relocatables? That is true. Okay, so it's not a set number of years like we've had for devices or anything along those lines. That's true. So it does offer us the flexibility as we provide those more long-term solutions for our yes, children. Yes, it does. Awesome, thank you so much. Are there any other questions, Mr. Kuhn? Since we're leasing and purchasing relocatable classrooms, can you just um, share with us the decision making as to when you would lease versus when you would purchase and, and how, how that decisioning occurs? Uh, at, at this time, we have a total of 58 leased unit and we have 187 owned units. The units that are owned, we don't pay any rental, it's fixed cost, and we own it. But after due course of time, we have to replace some of those units uh, because the useful life is only so many years. So every year we look at it and manage a mix of leased and relocatable units. So you have to look at how many do you always have need for and how many is for temporary time so that's how we manage it just to follow on yeah. what um, what do you consider temporary time for relocatables temporary time the break-even point for the lease and is anywhere from five to seven years or sometimes less than that so if we know that we are going to need it for more than seven years mm -hmm. then it's in our interest to buy it if we don't know the future and you know we know it could be a temporary need so we lease it so so if i understand you you're saying that buying relocatables f where we we don't see the ability to not need those relocatables in the next 7 plus years and and we're leasing in areas where we believe we won't need those in in 7 or less years that's true, but it's a still a judgment call because we don't know how many we are going to need for more than seven years. So there's a, there's a judgment that needs to be made. And the units that we lease or we own, they can be transferred also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And in discussing the relocatables, um, I have a question. With the discussion about Pleasant Plains going through a boundary um, study, I'm curious, why not a learning an annex at Pleasant Plains? There's uh, elementary schools in my district that have a learning annex that's classrooms and a hallway and bathrooms, so it does provide capacity yeah. uh, and it allows students to stay in their neighborhood school and so forth. We have some special programs at, at Pleasant Plains um, that community members really uh, appreciate. Yeah, there are several different advantages we have uh, using relocatable. Uh, that's the quick delivery time and also lower cost. If you have what you're talking about, modular unit, 
the code requirements and the ti timing for that is closer to a new construction. So if we know for sure that the need is on a long run basis, then it's in our interest to build addition or a new school, whatever the case may be. And the code requirement for modular is more in line with construction. Okay, thank you. Are there any other additional questions? Okay, all in favor of approving items N1 through N15, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you. Next item is item O, new business, curricula, and for that, I call on curriculum committee chair, Ms. Mack. Thank you. Um, Chairwoman Causey and members of the board, this evening we're bringing forward the annual additions and changes to the master course file that were vetted and reviewed by the curriculum committee for approval. An executive summary of these changes is provided for the board's review as presented in Exhibit O. Do I have a motion to approve Exhibit O? Thank you, Mr. McMillian. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Mr. Kuhn? I just had some basic questions about some course name changes. Um, I'm looking at the world languages on page two, and it's going from Spanish grade six to beginner Spanish level A and B and then intermediate Spanish. And my questioning really comes down to is, is the change in name due to the fact that these courses would be available to different grade levels? Yeah, so good evening, Mr. Kuhn, uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, Ms. White, and members of the board. Um, the name change really reflects the proficiency level. And so typically students do move through a language program in cohorts, and that has been how we've identified it traditionally as grade six Spanish, grade seven Spanish. If you have a student who enters your building and perhaps their fluency is at a different level, then you could custom that, customize that. So if you have a student, for example, that enters, um, what's your middle school, sir? Is it Dumbarton? It's Dumbarton. Dunbarton. Yes. Let's say you have a student who moves into Dunbarton, and they happen to be in seventh grade, um, but they have a fluency that is higher than seventh grade. Um, they could then be placed in a higher level, but typically students move through when they're in the program from start to finish. They move through in grade bands. No different than we do with English. If you think about a student in a grade level that is, uh, uh, you know, we don't say sixth grade English, seventh grade English, eighth grade English. It's their English class for that grade level. And within any class, you're going to have a range of um, in English reading levels and a world language proficiency levels. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Are there any other questions? All in favor? Oh, Mr. Kuhn? I'm, I'm, this is fan fantastic. We're adding new courses, and, and specifically, I'm looking at the um, world languages again under American Sign Language. Um, so you have American Sign Language level one, and you have American Sign Language grade eight. Um, and I'm just wondering where they're going to be offered. Mm -hmm. What schools? Ahead, right, so um, good evening. So um, our hope would be that we would um, ultimately or eventually offer them everywhere. It doesn't always work out that way in terms of staffing. So this course is going to be brand new. We're creating it in partnership with CCBC. So this is um, a brand new concept, and it's really in response to um, several reasons. Our population of students who have dyslexia, for which learning another language is very challenging, this would allow them to earn their world languages credit um, while still um, working on their reading um, intervention support. Um, and ultimately, the course would result in them being certified as interpreters. So our goal long term would be for it to be offered everywhere, ultimately. Now, obviously, that's going to have challenges with staffing um, because you'll need a very specific certification. So we have not yet identified schools where we would start. This is about giving us permission from the board to be, begin the work of actually developing the course. Um, so probably next year's update, we'll be ready to talk about specific schools identified. But the long-range plan would be everywhere. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for that question, and thank you, Ms. Shea, for uh, being available to answer that. Ms. Jose. Thank you. Um, I, I saw a class here, P Tech to CAD. What grade level is that offered to? And do you guys have Autodesk license? Yes, yeah, so uh, P-TECH Intro to CAD uh, will be offered um, 
primarily at this point, our P-TECH program is at Dundalk High School, um, and it would be um, the basic two-dimensional drafting principles um, on AutoCAD and other computer-aided drafting design software. And so the grade level, I believe, would be for the 10th grade? Yes. And thank yes, you. we do have the software. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay. So all in favor of approving Exhibit O, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And our next item of business is item P, new business, special project request, West Towson Elementary School. And for that, we call forward Ms. Byers. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Kazi, Ms. Hen, Superintendent White, members of the board. Tonight, I am bringing forward for your approval a privately funded capital project to purchase and install two buddy benches at West Towson Elementary. This project is being funded by a donation from the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. Um, these benches will be installed, both benches will be installed near the West House and Playgrounds, really with the intent of allowing students to establish and build friendships. The total cost of the project is $3,005.70. Um, GBMC has donated $2,164.70, and the remaining cost of $841 will be covered by the West Towson Elementary School Foundation. In accordance with policy and rule 7330, uh, this request has progressed through all of our normal internal processes for review. And I would like to thank and acknowledge Principal Sue Hirschfeld, who's here tonight, um, for, <laughs> for her leadership. So with that, I bring this forward for your approval. Do I have a motion to approve? Do I have so a motion to approve the West Towson Elementary School buddy benches? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, do I have a second? Okay, so Ms. Hen approved, um, motioned, and Mr. Kuhn seconded. Is there any discussion? Ms. Rowe? So I've never heard of an elementary school that had their own foundation before. The, is this the PTA or is it something different? So it is. It is a private organization um, for the elementary school. We do have some schools with foundations. Any other questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Byers. And the next item is item Q, new business, report on the proposed Dogwood and Johnny Cake Elementary Capacity Relief Studies. And for that, we will hear from um, Mr. Brown, Doctor, excuse me, Dr. Brown. And, <laughs> and team. I think I see Mr. Cropper and Dr. Jones. So Superintendent White, uh, members of the board and the community, pleased to be here uh, again this evening <laughs> speaking with you uh, at the culmination of a boundary process that again started quite a while back. Um, some of you are familiar with Matthew Cropper. Uh, he is a consultant who has worked with us on boundaries uh, for an extended period of time, uh, about five years now. And uh, you know, when you talk about excellence in the boundary process, uh, I would say that he's been a wonderful partner in this work and hel has helped us push towards best practices over time and has been uh, very much um, responsive as we move forward to our community and, and the needs of, as we've gone forward. So without further ado, um, I, I'm going to hand things over to, to Mr. Cropper to, to start going through the process, and then at the conclusion, Dr. Jones will talk about our next steps and how we're, we're going to um, begin to implement this in the coming year. Thank you, Dr. Brown, Chair Causey, members of the board, Superintendent White. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, I'm here tonight to present to you the recommendations for the Dogwood Elementary and Johnny Cake Elementary Capacity Relief Studies. Um, this is a little bit of a different um, uh, pr a process that you may have seen in the past and that we are, we are presenting two, proce two processes uh, simultaneously here as we did the work simultaneously over the last several months. Slide here. 
Okay, there we go. So, um, to start, the, uh, a little bit of background and introduction over this region. And, um, the New Chadwick, area, area, ele New Chadwick Elementary School was anticipated to provide capacity relief to several schools in this area. Um, the current enrollment projections do indicate, however, that upon completion, Chadwick Elementary School will not have additional capacity to uh, provide relief to other adjacent schools. Um, therefore, the relief at Johnny Cake and Dogwood Elementary Schools can be provided through a two-part measure. It's moving programs and also uh, changing attendance boundaries. When considering schools that could provide capacity relief to the area, um, Dogwood Elementary uh, was, was paired with Featherbed Lane Elementary, um, and Johnny Cake Elementary was paired with Edmondson Heights in terms of looking at adjacencies and which schools have available capacity to provide some relief, um, as well as uh, the, to adjacent to the schools that, that need the relief. The process uh, occurred in four phases, as it, as it typically does. Uh, phase one is the planning part of the process. Uh, from August to December of last year, uh, the superintendent initiated a boundary study process. Um, the staff held orientation for principals and communicated with the community, um, some outreach to the public to let them know what's going on. The staff prepared data and information in preparation for the committee's work, and then the committee was convened. The second phase is uh, really the, the meat of the work with the public engagement and also the, the community-based committee, where the committee is working through uh, the process of evaluating options and developing options and also soliciting input from the public and things like that. that occurred January through April of 2019. Um, and here we are at the uh, phase three of the process, which is the um, Board of Education's phase of the process, where we present the recommendations to you, and then it's up to the board to make a decision on, uh, on how they want to proceed with the recommendation. And that is expected to occur between May and June of 2019 um, as, it re as it relates to a, a presentation of the recommendations and then a public hearing process and such. Um, and then your approval. Once the uh, phase four comes online, it's basically the process of the staff implementing the boundaries and working through um, uh, notifying parents and staffing and making adjustments to account for the change that has been uh, approved. This boundary, the boundaries uh, do become effective in, for the 2020-2021 school year. This is just a glimpse of the timeline uh, for both processes. They were running simultaneously. So at the very beginning of the process, we did some meetings on the same evening uh, and back to back so sort of on staggered times in the same evening. And as we got further along in the process, we started to, to, to uh, do them on alternate days so that we can make sure that we had enough time to, uh, in consideration for the committee to, to look at all of the, the factors and, uh, and uh, components of the study. So the objectives of the study, uh, of this community-based comprehensive boundary study, is to, to meet the following key objectives. Uh, is those are to provide capacity relief to Dogwood and Johnny Cake Elementary Schools, to create viable and su su successful boundaries to effectively utilize capacity, and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. There are rules that we follow, as always, um, that, that are administered by the board, and these are the rules that we always uh, orient the, the committee on, as well as the public, and I always encourage the board to, to consider these rules when you look at, at the recommendations as well. And these are per Rule 1280, and these are to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system, the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned, and efficient use of capacity in affected schools. Additional rules that, uh, uh, that the committee was focused on include long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future cap capital plans, location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns, phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, which doesn't apply to this process because we are focused only on elementaries and uh, the recommendation is only to make adjustments to elementary boundaries. And then additional considerations which adhere to some best practices in the industry are to use a, a geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways when, I, when, when determining uh, and considering boundary adjustments. So the boundary study committees uh, 
uh, consisted of nine members. There were seven voting members on each committee. Uh, one principal was on, was on each committee and they were a non-voting member. Um, there was one teacher and staff representative on each committee, four parents, which, which com, uh, consists of two from each school, and then one area educational advisory council representative. Um, these were, uh, this is the composition of both committees that we worked with. Uh, each committee met five times between January and April and working through the options, and they collaborated, collaborated exclusively with each other and worked together. I was really proud of this, both committees and the, and the dynamic that they had, and it was, um, it was not an adversarial type of, uh, uh, of conversations. They really worked as a cohesive unit, and I was really proud that they focused on a, a plan and developing a recommendation that was best for all children in the study areas and not just one particular community, neighborhood, or school. Um, they reviewed and agreed upon planning blocks to support the study, and they discussed and revised multiple scenarios. And uh, we also used additional outreach methods to, uh, to, to ensure transparency, which include the BCPS website. Uh, email was provided, so anybody could provide emails uh, and, and provide input that way. And there were also online interactive maps so the public and also committee and staff could see how the boundaries really affected the neighborhoods and, and get a detailed understanding of that. In terms of public participation and input, uh, letters were sent to all families in September 2018 regarding the process to inform them of what was coming up. Um, there was additional outreach after that to, to make sure that, um, that they were informed of, what was, of how the process was maturing and things that were ongoing. The public was invited to attend all committee meetings as observers. And we welcome the public to come watch from the back. And uh, as long as they don't participate or interrupt the work of the committee, the public are always welcome to observe the process. Um, all the meetings were live streamed on the website, and those are all saved and stored as, uh, as YouTube clips, which is a very, very uh, useful tool that Baltimore County uh, has uh, for the public. And then all information is provided to committee, uh, that was provided to the committee was made available on a web page dedicated to the, both processes so that any member of the public could go download and print any materials that were shared with the committee at any time. The public was invited to uh, provide input throughout the process, as I said, through the website and email. Um, in addition to that, we had a public information meeting for each process. Um, we had 33 total respondents participate in the online survey, and it was provided in both English and Spanish. Um, the Dogwood Featherbed Lane process had 16 responses to the uh, public information session and to, to, the, um, to that outreach effort, and Johnny Cake Edmondson Heights had 17 responses. Um, I think you should note that uh, you see the, 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 you may think that's a small number of responses uh, for a, a boundary change study, uh, but one of the things to note is that what we were looking at was um, making minimal, minimal changes to accomplish our objectives, and so therefore there was not a, a large number, a large segment of the community, community was not impacted in this process. So we were looking at moving small sections of the community to accomplish our objectives. And so I'm not surprised that we didn't have um, a, a much larger numbers like we have seen in other uh, larger boundary change studies. Each committee considered four scenarios through the course of the study. They reviewed and discussed all materials with a focus on the considerations, and they did recognize that no single scenario would equally satisfy all of the considerations. I think it's um, in every process I work with across the country, I think no plan is ever going to be perfect. Because there's things that we can't control, uh, where the schools are located, how many seats are available, how many kids live in various communities, but they did their best with a focus on what was best for all students in the area, um, knowing that no plan would be perfect. Um, the all four options were presented to the public at the at the public information sessions, and uh, we surveyed them on those to get their in, uh, additional input. And the committee uh, looked at that input. We reported that back to the committee, and they studied that, and they continued their their important work. Getting to uh, the specifics of each study, Dogwood Elementary School. Um, uh, one of the things to note, uh, we, I had mentioned earlier that there were pro it was a combination of program moves and boundary changes to help uh, a combination would provide the uh, accomplish our objectives. So regional special education programs at Featherbed Lane Elementary uh, will relocate in coordination with this, this effort. Um, this movement will reduce enrollment and provide additional capacity uh, to the schools th that we're working with in this, in this study. 
The anticipated impact of this program move includes 15 fewer students at Featherbed Lane Elementary to reflect the program movement, and that results in an increase in the capacity of the school um, from 654 to 667, and that's uh, due to, to converting uh, special education classrooms into regular education, which can house more students. So uh, this is just a slide to show you the before and after. Before we started boundary changes at all, uh, before and after for the, uh, how the program moves would, would provide an incremental um, benefit to the schools to help provide more opportunity to balance utilization. We had four options, and these are the four options. And um, for this process, uh, the, the, the areas that were of focus in the study are uh, east areas east of Rolling Road that are in the Dogwood area, Dogwood Elementary attendance area. That area was examined as to an area to move to Featherbed Lane. Uh, Rolling Road is a, a, a pretty um, busy road, and that was one of the things that they had gone back and forth and considering. Um, in addition, there um, the Dogwood boundary um, stretches north um, up into near areas that are already feeding into Featherbed Lane Elementary, primarily a large scale apartment complex. Uh, several different apartment complexes uh, make up this uh, a dense area in the north. Uh, some of those apartments already go to Featherbed Lane, and so the committee was considering moving some additional areas to uh, Featherbed Lane out of Dogwood in this area to help accomplish their objectives. So you'll see in option one, there was an adjustment between Rolling Road and the north. Uh, option two, uh, they, all of the options basically uh, come up with a combination of both, different areas in the apartments versus, and also Rolling Road. Option three as well is just a different configuration of some of the areas in the north, but still has Rolling Road go to Featherbed Lane. And then option four is one that moves more, a higher share of the, the apartments and does not move the area east of Rolling Road into um, Featherbed Lane. The committee's recommendation was to uh, to recommend option two. Um, they uh, at the March 20th meeting they voted. Uh, there were three votes cast for option two. Um, the committee really. Uh, deliberated on this and looked at all of the factors and considerations and they felt like option two was the best option to recommend because uh, the, the, the primary rationale from the committee was that it moved the fewest number of students but but still accomplished their objectives um, and that was and that is what the what the committee felt most importantly about as they as they move toward this recommendation the um, you could see the utilization before and, a, before and after the recommendation. Uh, Dogwood is 112% utilized currently, and once the recommendation, uh, if the recommendation were approved, Dogwood Elementary would be about 103% utilized, and Featherbed Lane would go from 88% to 97%. It's important to note that they were really trying to balance things, and they, they wanted to make uh, provide relief to Dogwood, but they didn't want to create an issue at Featherbed Lane, and so. Um, and they want to solve their, accomplish their objectives, but not create new issues. And so that's why you see um, Featherbed Lane's at 97% and, and Dogwood is still a little over 100, but they still get that relief that, that they felt was adequate. There was no impact on demographics as a result of this, of this adjustment. Um, and you can see that the option two, the recommendation does move the fewest number of students of so 57 out of uh, um, uh, 57 students were impacted in, in comparison to the other options. In terms of feeder patterns, there is, uh, as I mentioned, the focus was only on elementary school. Um, the elementary, the study area that we're working with, the middle schools, um, Windsor Mill and Woodlawn, they share the same line. So any adjustment that we made to provide relief to Dogwood was going to have an impact and, and would create a, 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 an impact on the feeder patterns. So currently, uh, Dogwood feeds 100% into Windsor Mill and Featherbed Lane feeds 100% into Woodlawn. But as a result of this, it does create a, a feeder pattern split. So uh, some of the Featherbed Lane community will be, um, will be at Windsor Mill and, uh, and, uh, the do and, and also Woodlawn uh, Middle School because of the adjustments that, that occurred at the elementary school level. Looking at Johnny Cake Elementary, uh, on the same note, with uh, talking about the program adjustments, uh, Johnny Cake Elementary um, had some uh, 
special programs that are planned to relocate in coordination with the study uh, to provide additional capacity relief. Um, this, uh, the program moves at Johnny Cake result in 35 fewer students at the school to uh, reflect the program movement, which uh, results in an increase in state rated capacity from 559 to 588. Before and after moves, just before we started working with, pro, with uh, boundaries, you can see that that does provide some additional relief to Johnny Cake Elementary um, in, in this uh, as a result of that adjustment. And but it still does need did need more relief uh, as a res through uh, boundary changes. We looked at four options uh, with this. Uh, one of the things to note is that all of the area that was considered uh, falls within the walkable area to either school. So they were focused on not, not putting students who can walk on a bus. And so they were focused on the areas that were right on the border between Edmondson Heights and Johnny Cake that can walk to either school. Um, Ingleside Road was a, was, a, was a road that was discussed pretty heavily because it's a fairly busy road that goes through the uh, that connects connects between Johnny Cake and Edmondson Heights, and so they were looking at options that tried to reduce the number of students that had to cross over Ingleside Road. So option one uh, looked on the south side of Ingleside going to Edmondson Heights. Option two focused on an area north of uh, north of Ingleside going to Edmondson Heights from Johnny Cake. Option three moved the line down, just uh, the Edmondson Heights down a little bit, a couple of blocks closer to Johnny Cake to, pr to provide that relief that is needed. And option four was a combination of looking at south of Ingleside and moving the, the Edmondson Heights line a little bit further south to Johnny Cake. It was sort of a hybrid option that the committee had, had worked up. So all the voting members, uh, recommended option four at the April 4th, 2019 meeting. Uh, seven votes were cast for the option. Um, and the committee felt like this, this option um, provided the best balance of enrollment. Um, and I'll show you the before and after here. So you could see that both schools, as a result of their recommendation, fall below 100% utilization. So they, they felt like it, it, uh, it doesn't get much better than that in terms of balancing uh, utilization and, and per their recommendation. I was proud of them and the work that they did in crafting this, this, uh, this option. There is no impact on minority and uh, you can see that option four does impact uh, 75 students. It doesn't, it, there are, were other options considered that impacted fewer, but they felt like this, that the, that the recommendation best met the overall considerations and objectives. There is no impact on feeder patterns in this particular area. Uh, so uh, so the, the feeder patterns, there is no change in where elementary schools feed as it regard, regards to middle schools in this particular study. Thank you. Good evening, um, Board Chair, Vice Chair, and Ms. White. Um, the next steps are for the Board of Education public hearing, which will take place at Woodlawn High School at 6.30 on May 15th. That will be another opportunity for the community to engage and provide input and will take place in the auditorium. In terms of the next opportunity um, for the public to engage, it will be July 11th here um, at 6.30, and that will be an opportunity to vote, to have the Board of Education, you all vote on the boundary. Um, we want to thank you for your time, and um, we appreciate your engagement as we shared the boundary studies for um, Dogwood and Johnny Cake. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Jones. And just to clarify that the um, the board will vote on the recommendation that's June 11th. June 11th. 2019. I, June 11th, 2019. June 11th, 2019. I yes. appreciate that look into July. That's July. great. But we're going to be here no, it will discussing be, this. It will be June 11th. Thank June you. June 11th. And there'll be an opportunity for community input there as well. Board members, do I have questions? Ms. Mack? I don't have a question. I have a comment. Um, I came as an observer, yes. and I was very impressed with the level of engagement of the community members. It was almost like they were running the process themselves. The night I was there, I think they actually proposed a different map than the maps you even presented. Yes, and they were just so engaged and they worked so collaboratively. So I was very, very impressed with this process. Yeah. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Other questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your work on this and we look forward to hearing from the public May 15th at Woodlawn High School. That brings us to our next item on the agenda, which is item R, board member comments. 
And for that, I will start with Mr. Offerman and just go right around the dais. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a thank you. I have a pleasure of meeting with three different groups who uh, did a great job in explaining programs of, of interest that I had. Uh, I had a meeting uh, where I was uh, uh, given a tremendous amount of information and, and, a, and a depth of understanding in the, uh, in the uh, CTE program, which I think will, will, is going to be even a bigger part of, of uh, Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, Ms. Shea, Dr. Handy, and Mr. Grubb. Uh, did a great job of, of explaining what the present programs are and, uh, and gave me great insight into what's coming, which I think is really exciting. I also met with uh, Dr. McComas, uh, excuse me, I don't know, yeah, met Mr. Korn, Dr. Adams, and Mr. I think it's I, Embriala uh, about the Baltimore County's efforts to keep the, the Baltimore County data secure. And it, it was quite it was quite complete, and, and I, 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 we have real reason to be proud of the work that, that, they, are, that, that, that they are doing now, uh, particularly in this uh, era when data, data leakage and, and, and data uh, acquisition is, 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 is a major, major issue. BCPS looks to me like they're, 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 they're leading the way in, in, in trying to make sure that our, student, our data is safe, our students and our, and our, uh, and our staff. I also had the pleasure of meeting with Mr. Smith and Dr. Brown so I would get a better understanding of the whole process of, of prioritizing school replacements and, and, and what the needs are there. And uh, this was unfortunately, uh, or this wasn't unfortunately, it was, uh, unfortunately after that we, we had the decision made by the, uh, by the, uh, by the State Senate, uh, which uh, uh, changed our, our current plans and certainly make, makes an impact which leads me even more to think that we need to be as tightly planned and, and as tightly focused on, on, on prioritizing schools for the best of, 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 of the students above all other, all other concerns to, to work from. So I, I thank them and uh, well, all these meetings were very, very helpful to me and I, I, know, I know they took time from a, a lot of people's very, very busy schedule. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out that we seem to have extreme growth in, in multiple areas throughout the county. And um, as we're having these discussions, um, especially, you know, we were talking about the Northeast uh, this evening, but we realized that they're happening in, in various places, that we try and take a look and, and um, uh, get a feel for the overall impact through all of the schools. It's just because we have a, a massive move through uh, Perry Hall Middle School that's going to lead to a massive amount of kids in Perry Hall High School uh, soon enough. And there's tremendous growth in that area um, with, with new elementary schools um, uh, having gone up. So um, as we move forward, uh, let's make sure that we're, we're looking at the big picture as much as we can and working as a team to make sure that we're addressing these issues and providing um, students the best options we can uh, at the point in time we're at. Thank you. Ms. Pester. Thank you. Some unknown person said that next in a in importance to freedom and justice is education, without which neither freedom nor justice can be permanently maintained. So to all who are still in this room, out there in TV land, and up here on the dais, who in one way or another have taught our young people and some who are not so young, I thank you. And I thank those who support all of you, who support our teachers, who help them grow, and those of you who, like my good friend, my new friend, Sharon Seroff, who makes me want to run sometimes, <laughs> but I know that she is always about children and always out for the best for children and that means working with teachers, I thank you. And for the staff at Watershed, thank you for being gracious, answering my questions, 
and having those binders out so I could see every little thing and being patient as I went through the binders and kept asking one more question, one more question. So thank you to everyone who makes a difference in the lives of our children. Mr. Hayden. That was when she had her Columbo hat on where she sort of started for the door and then she said, just one more question. Uh, for anybody who's watched Columbo over the years, that was his uh, modus operandi uh, doing that. One of the things that uh, I, I mentioned in, in my earlier remarks, which I think is so important, is that all of us who sit around this table are not just responsible for those kids who live in the district from which we were appointed. We are responsible for children all over Baltimore County. So there's not one district to say that, even though it's been changed a little bit with this election por uh, portion, but back when I first went on, as I mentioned in those remarks, you were represented a district, but at the same time, you were told by a fellow named Byron Williams, who was a long-serving member of the board and who was both president and vice president of the board, that your job was to represent all the children of Baltimore County, and, and that, is, uh, that is our job. Even though we have more specialized knowledge in an area where we were appointed from, perhaps, uh, our job is still all the children in Baltimore County. Um, and, and I'm thinking about naming a movie after this next remark I just thought about. We talk about all this growth, and it's sort of just like back to the future. Would that be a good movie title? But that's where we're going. We've been there. We've done that. There's no mystery in this. It's just a matter of marching through, listening, and acting. We have a great staff who really works hard at getting these things done. Uh, and, and it enables us to make decisions based on uh, what's going to happen in the future. Again, nothing that we haven't done plenty of times in the past. So it's basically doing our homework, concentrating, asking questions, and making a decision. And with our superintendent and staff, uh, I think we're well suited to be able to do that as we move forward. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Mrs. Kent, Mrs. Walters, Mrs. Schneider, Mr. Myers, Mrs. Huff. You may not recognize these names, but they were my first five teachers at Hartford Hills Elementary. I remember them to this day. I think of them every time I'm at this dais. They are why I'm here where I am today. They put up with me, and I am thankful and will ever be thankful for the impact that they've made on my life, as I am thankful for each and every one of our thousands of teachers who touch our students' lives every day. To you, I want to say thank you. Those two words seem terribly inadequate to express my appreciation for what you do for our boys and girls every day. But thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Thank you. Uh, I do want to thank all of the teachers. I do want to thank all of the teachers listening and also all the teachers sitting on the dais here with me, Mr. Offerman. Ms. Pestor, Ms. White, who has also been a teacher, but not you, Mr. McMillian. <laughs> <So you. laughs> I also want to thank all of the staff and the nurses, um, especially having a child that has life-threatening food allergies. I am very grateful to the nurses in our schools that help me work with peace of mind. So thank you for everything, and good night. Mr. McMillian. I want to thank everybody because everywhere I go in my travels around Baltimore County Public Schools, I'm received cordially.
people were polite to me. I'm not, I'm not used to a lot of that. <laughs> but people just treat me with such dignity and respect, and, and I really appreciate that. And that goes from the central office staff to Mr. and Mrs. Ryan to everybody. And I'd be remiss if I started naming people, because everywhere I go, people treat me with dignity and respect, and I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to date myself with, with a historical perspective. In 1966, I was a seventh grade student at Stemmer's Run Junior High School, and we had Perry Hall students that were transported to Stemmer's Run for two years before they were then returned back to their home school. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. <laughs> so it can happen. Ms. Mack. Um, yes, um, I'd like to say that on April 12th, Mr. McMillian and I attended Western Tech's Cultural Coalescence event. And I was so impressed by it. Um, I was impressed by the level of effort that the students put into their presentations. I was impressed by um, the encouragement that students gave each other. When you think of high school students, you don't think of them going out in the middle of a big, big gym and doing a dance from their home country and having everybody around them cheering them on and clapping. And I saw nothing but preparation and encouragement and support, and I was really wowed by it. In the spirit of teacher appreciation, I'd like to thank all the teachers out there. I cannot imagine doing your job. But I'd also like to thank Wanda Warfield, who was a teacher I had at Lakeland Elementary School that Dr. McComas knows. She always acted like she didn't want to be there, that she didn't think she should have been at that school. But in spite of that, she held us to a very high standard. She never, ever gave up on us. And as a result of Ms. Warfield, um, I learned to value education and took her lessons with me throughout my life. So I hope she's still alive, um, and I hope somehow she gets this, but she did have quite an impact on me. Well, I'd like to start by thanking all of the hardworking teachers, um, those here on the dais, and as well as those in the audience and um, any that are watching um, at home, because it is a, a job a lot of times that you don't get um, a lot of thanks for. So I, I would like to definitely um, thank all the teachers. Um, I'd also like to especially thank the teachers I had the opportunity and um, staff and principal and everyone. Um, I visited Woodmore Elementary School and I was very impressed with what I saw there with the teaching staff, with the principals, with the children who were so eager to learn. They were excited about school and you get excited because you have a good teacher and because you're, you're excited about learning. And um, it was just a pleasure I was welcomed, like Rod said, I was, I was welcomed. The children were almost falling over each other to try and show me their work and, and what they were doing. And, and that was just, that was wonderful. That, that made my day. I was smiling for the, for the rest of the day. And um, it, it's a very diverse school, and that's reflected by the community that's around um, the school. And what I was also impressed with is that they're, they're teaching the children to be global leaders. They had a very, it was very international, and they also have a strong partnership with the community, and that's important. So it's the community at school, but then it's the larger community, and working together in partnership, that's when you really have success, and it was evident when I visited, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Ms. Rose? So in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week, I would just like to say thank you to all the teachers. When I first um, had my children and they were young, I didn't always have the confidence or even know that what I was doing with them was the right thing to do. And they say children don't come with a handbook. And at that time, I had um, someone who's a teacher now, she was here actually, Erica Falcon, was part of something BCPS had then, it was the hippie program where a teacher will come to your house and help you with early childhood learning. And she came and she's helping me with my older daughters and Ida. And um, I was talking to her about how Aiden really wasn't talking the way he was supposed to. And she said, oh, oh, well, there's, you can go and have him evaluated and get speech therapy. And the support of having an early childhood program in a school system is something that I didn't even know as a parent that we had in Baltimore County, or that it's free and the parents can just come and do this. 
And what I found out is that as a parent, over the years, if I didn't know what to do with something that was going on with my children, maybe they didn't come to me with a handbook, but there are these teachers who are highly educated professionals who know collectively everything there is to know about children. And if you find one and you ask them, they will tell you a hundred different ways to solve the problem that you're having or give you the information that you don't have. And so as a parent and as a community leader, I have very much appreciated the impact of teachers in my life, in my children's life, and in our community. Because more often than not, I've been able to share that information with other members of our community. So I believe that we need to do everything we can to support teachers and to value their contribution to our society. So thank you, teachers, for everything. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to point out this evening, we touched on in a number of ways, overcrowding, redistricting, uh, relocatables, um, different aspects of our uh, construction plan. And we are hopeful that what the uh, superintendent recommended, the board proposed and approved, and that the county executive approved that's moving now in front of the county council is the piece of the budget that relates to a 10-year strategic plan, where Baltimore County would engage uh, for the first time with the county executive, the county council, the board of education, the superintendent, school administration, and most importantly, the community to identify all the needs and to, in a very uh, holistic way, but also um, pragmatic way in terms of prioritizing according to needs. How can we uh, take care of the needs of the students at the fastest possible point in the highest priority um, so that we can improve their education? So we're hoping that that piece moves forward and that would be something that we would start to engage in this summer. Um, I do want to just thank everyone, interim superintendent, the staff, and again, once, uh, once again, thanks to all the teachers. Um, the last items are item S. There's information on board docs related to the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting. Their minutes of March 26 are on board docs. Also, the last is the announcements of uh, the board public hearing, which we talked about for the proposed Dogwood and Johnny Cake Elementary School capacity relief is Wednesday, March 15th at 6.30 p.m. at Woodlawn High School. The next board meeting is here. Tuesday, May 21st at 6.30 p.m. And also there will be, uh, looking forward a bit, there will be a board public hearing of the fiscal year 2021 capital budget Wednesday, May 22nd, 6.30 p.m. here in Greenwood. And our meeting is adjourned.